I've been making videos of advice from famous authors for a couple of years now, so what I thought I would do is put them all together in one place. One mammoth video resource. So have a look through, see if your favourite author's listed, and if not, leave me a comment, let me know who they are, and I'll see if I can make a video about them in the future. We're starting with Elmore Leonard. It's never a bad idea to look at other writers and see how they do things. So with that in mind, let's have a look at Elmore Leonard's top advice for writers and see what we can learn from him. He wrote crime and westerns mainly, really gritty stories with fantastic dialogue. So here's his top tips. Number one, never open a book with the weather. Yeah, makes sense. It's easy to agree with this one, and not just because opening a story with the weather is seen as a massive cliche. No, my biggest problem with it is actually that it's the beginning of your story. It's the one guaranteed chance you've got to grab your reader and pull them in. And stories are about people, not, you know, drizzle. That stuff might enhance your setting and create a nice atmosphere, but all of that stuff is really just staging for the real story, which will inevitably be about people. So get a person in your opening as that came out wrong. <laughs> Introduce a character as quickly as you can. And if you absolutely have to have a thunderstorm in the opening of your book, then at least show some character running away from it. Number two, avoid prologues. Another piece of advice I see fairly often, but my writing is on the literary side, so it's not a problem I've really had to contend with. I've never tried writing a prologue, but I have read them. In the same way that the weather may not draw a reader in in the most effective way, I think prologues are kind of at risk of doing the same thing. My general thoughts are, if you have things about your world or your story that the reader absolutely has to know to understand it, then try and inform them as the story goes along. In the early stages, try and get some of that exposition in if you possibly can, rather than front-loading it with a load of info dumping. Easy for me to say though, having never tried that kind of writing. However, what if your prologue is great and it's really well written and it genuinely enhances the story and grabs your reader by the hand and pulls them in? I'm definitely not saying never write a prologue, but then again, I suppose neither is Almore Leonard. He's just saying, avoid them. Maybe we can just meet in the middle somewhere and say avoid prologues that aren't absolutely exceptional. Number three, never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. I made a video about exactly this, which I'll link up there, but I do agree with this advice and that is generally how I write. No shouted, no exclaimed, no screamed, none of that. I just tend to find they get in the way for me. It's yet another choice of wording that I've got to make in the middle of a story when said would actually just fit most situations anyway. And the other thing is I find that when I'm reading, words like that just remind me that I'm reading a piece of fiction and take me out of the story. Said just floats by unnoticed. It's almost like punctuation at this point. It's just a facilitator of the story that doesn't get in the way of anything can't always guarantee the same for exclaimed or retorted. Plus, I just really enjoy the challenge of trying to create the effect that those words would bring using context in the story instead. However, this is without a doubt one of those pieces of advice that has been hijacked by this kind of snooty elitism. I personally have nothing against writers that use words other than said. Too many of them, then yeah, maybe tone it down a little bit, maybe calm down just a little bit but there's no reason it has to be all or nothing. I'm sure readers' opinions and preferences differ wildly on this, and of course it's always gonna depend on your target audience. Avoiding those words is just my particular preference. He mentioned. Number four, never use an adverb to modify the verb said. We're still on this. Okay, pushing the whole dialogue thing pretty hard. Might not be a surprise, but I agree with this one as well. I do avoid adverbs in my own writing, but this this piece of advice, this is the one that I most often see being weaponized against newer or younger or less experienced writers. We don't do that on this channel. We use writing advice to lift people up and to help them make their writing better. If you want to use adverbs, that's fine. I just might encourage you not to rely on them to create meaning. 
I think it's generally a pretty bad idea to 100% rule out anything when it comes to writing. If you want to use an adverb to modify the word said, if you feel like it's necessary for your story, then throw one in. But if it isn't necessary, I'd definitely say avoid it. Never say never though. Number five, keep your exclamation points under control. You're allowed no more than two or three per 100,000 words of prose. I'm not sure if it was Mark Twain or F. Scott Fitzgerald, it's attributed to both, but one of them said, an exclamation point is like laughing at your own joke. That does tend to be how exclamation points feel to me when I'm reading, I have to be honest. Again, I like to try to create that effect using context and in other ways. If what you've written or your character has said is shocking or surprising enough in the first place, then you probably don't really need an exclamation point. If the exclamation point is the only indicator of surprise in the whole sentence, I'd definitely try and say reinforce some of the context around it so that that does most of the work instead. But of course, if your characters happen to find a sign at the side of the road that says caution zombies, I don't really think anyone's going to bat an eyelid at an exclamation point on that. I think you can just go ahead and put one in. I'm not sure exactly how or why Elmore Leonard came up with exactly two or three per 100,000 words, but it seems about right to me. Why not? Number six, never use the words suddenly or all hell broke loose. That's great advice, I think. Suddenly is a massive crutch word for writers. It robs you of the opportunity to try to create that effect in other ways. But that's not even my biggest problem with it. My biggest problem is that when I read the word suddenly, it does exactly the opposite thing that it's supposed to do. This could easily just be me, but it feels like a giant signpost on the page as I'm reading that something unexpected is about to happen. Then, as I carry on and that unexpected thing does happen, I'm ready for it, so it doesn't feel as sudden. Yeah, we're probably talking about a second's warning maybe, but why not just drop that? Why dull the impact of what's to come? In my opinion, I'd rather let the reader be set upon by that sudden thing instead. Surely that's going to feel more sudden. I don't think we have to hold a reader's hand into a surprise. I don't think they'd even thank us for holding their hand through a surprise. I'd just prefer to let the reader wander straight into something unexpected and make of it what they will. All hell broke loose isn't a phrase that I've found myself wanting to use, probably just due to the nature of my stories, but I think the point that Elmore Leonard is trying to make is that it's a pretty lazy phrase when you think about it. Describing chaos and describing all hell breaking loose is a really difficult thing for writers to do, there's no doubt about it. So. Just putting all hell broke loose is kind of a sticking plaster solution that pushes the onus onto the reader to create that image in their head rather than the writer having to do it. I generally find that the things that feel hardest to write are the ones that are most worth writing. They're the things that will stand out for a reader and they're the things that will help you grow as a writer. Number seven, use regional dialect or patois sparingly. I ought to pay pretty close attention to this, I think, because I do use regional dialect in my writing, although I do my best to make sure it's not particularly specific or particularly thick, for want of a better word. I think as a flourish on dialogue that's already really good, a bit of regional dialect you can get away with, especially if it's on fleeting characters who are here one minute and gone the next. I mentioned this type of characterization in a recent video which I'll link up there, but you can create an idea of a much deeper character using one or two vivid details if that character is only around for a short amount of time and regional dialect or some kind of accent or turn of phrase I find is a nice way to do that. Another approach to this, and I've no idea how Elmore Leonard would have felt about this one, is instead of writing all of your character's dialogue as though they're speaking with an accent, instead just pick a few choice phrases or a few more regional phrases or idioms and characterize their dialogue in that way instead. That's my sneaky way around this particular rule anyway. Number eight, avoid detailed descriptions of characters. If you've ever read anything that I've written, and if you're curious, I've got a few stories up on my website, the link's in the description down below, then you may have noticed that I almost never describe characters at all. I'll describe their character, usually by using context or dialogue or just what happens in the story, but I pretty much never say anything about physical description. And I think that works for the type of stories that I write, and as a big fan of his writing, it definitely works for Elmore Leonard's stories. However, I do stand somewhere in the middle on this one. Some readers are really visual and enjoy a lot of description because it helps them visualise a story. That kind of reader might find my style really lacking and kind of sparse, and I can understand that. 
On the other hand, some readers like me don't really like reading a lot of description and find it difficult to take it in at all, so it wouldn't be a problem in that case. This one I think is absolutely down to reader or writer preference and nothing more than that. I don't like writing a lot of description just because I find it too heavy-handed, I feel too visible as a writer, if that makes any sense. But that's just my style, your mileage may vary. Number nine, don't go into great detail describing places and things. I already knew it, but it's really starting to make sense why I love Elmore Leonard's writing so much. This follows pretty much directly on from the last tip, and I agree with it. I wouldn't ever think of describing a landscape or the decoration of a room in any great detail. If I mention something that's in a room, for example, then it's usually for a reason that's directly related to the plot or the meaning of the story, even if that reason is only clear to me. This one though, I think could be largely genre driven. I write literary fiction that's pretty contemporary, so I only really need to use one or two small details to anchor the story. If you're writing fantasy or sci-fi and you've created this entire world from your imagination, you're gonna have to describe that, there's no way around it. And in that case, regular readers of the genre will probably be used to seeing that and will like it, so that'd work. There is one bonus tip from Elmore Leonard that I'll come on to shortly, but before that, number 10. Try to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. This is good advice too, in my opinion. If it's boring, cut it. We don't need to see everything that happens in a character's day. We definitely don't need to start the story with the character waking up and then proceed to follow them around as they go through their morning routine. We don't need to see that. My approach to this generally is if it doesn't matter, it doesn't make the cut. I think it's a good idea for us writers to ask ourselves questions about what we're writing. Questions like, am I putting this in the story because it affects the plot or the meaning or it's gonna affect the reader in some way? Or do I wanna put it in there because it sounds really cool and I want it in my story? If it's the latter, those sentences always have a target on their head as far as I'm concerned. Toss it overboard. The story will be better without it. I did mention a bonus tip coming up at the end. So here's Elmo Leonard's final piece of writing advice for us. If it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. George R. R. Martin. He of course wrote the A Song of Ice and Fire series, or he's still writing it, I'm not sure. I've seen a few interviews with him. It seems like an interesting guy, and he's definitely got some interesting takes when it comes to writing advice. So, here's 10 of his top tips for writers. Number one, the most important thing for any aspiring writer, I think, is to read. And not just the sort of thing you're trying to write, read everything. That's a good one. I think it's important to read if you're trying to write. It definitely is for me. Reading is what helps me come up with new ideas for stuff I want to write and keeps me engaged with the creative side of my brain, I suppose. But I especially like what he said about reading everything, not just the genre that you're trying to write. I think there's something to be learned from all manner of stories, all shapes and sizes. There's something you can take away from every single story you read, so I definitely agree with that. If you read widely, then you've got a lot more opportunity to steal stuff from a lot more places. It's important to spend a lot of time writing though, as well as reading, but you can't just read, you've got to balance the two. Balance how you consume and how you create, and then you'll find the sweet spot of productivity, I think. It's just science. It's not science. Number two, one of the big things that distinguishes the strongest fiction from writing that's perhaps without depth is a real understanding of what real human beings are like. Yes, definitely. That kind of advice is right up my street. I say it in my videos all the time, but stories are about people. You can have the grandest settings and the most intricate plots, but if your characters are made out of cardboard, no one's going to care about them and your story isn't going to speak to readers. If you've ever read any of the books in the Song of Ice and Fire series or to an extent watched Game of Thrones, then you'll be able to see how George R. R. Martin practices what he preaches here, I think. Every character seems to have a story of their own, even if we only see a small window into that story. It just makes them seem way more real. Number three, write every day, even if it's only a page or two. I was going to disagree eventually, so here it is. While there's definite benefits to writing regularly and staying engaged with writing, I don't think there's anything wrong on those days where you just can't get going and you just feel frustrated by your writing. I don't think there's anything wrong with just skipping those days. Forcing yourself to write every day feels kind of arbitrary to me and whenever I've done it, it's led me to read back what I'd written and think, well, at least it's done. And personally, I don't want to write stories like that because they always turn out really sh**. 
Number four, don't write in my universe or Tolkien's or the Marvel universe or the Star Trek universe or any other borrowed background. I'll have to risk the wrath of the fan fiction community on this one, but I agree with this. I do think it's better to stretch yourself to invent characters and worlds of your own rather than borrowing them from other authors. If I was gonna use an analogy, which I am, and an obvious one at that, I'd say it's like riding a bike with stabilizers or training wheels on. You're never gonna fall off and scrape your face along the floor, but you're also never gonna learn how to properly balance. I think falling on your face is a huge part of learning to ride. This is just me. Number five, I would suggest that any aspiring writer begin with short stories. He also says something here about how he meets new writers that have never written a thing and they're already planning a nine novel series. And he compares that to the Mount Everest of writing which I'm inclined to agree with. It may not surprise you, but I 100% agree with this advice as well. I've got nothing against writers starting out with novels, but for me, short fiction is the absolute best kind of writing to start with. And that's not because of plotting or character building or description or any of that stuff. It's just because short fiction gives you an opportunity to write an entire story from beginning to end. You build experience with every part of the story. Finishing things I think is important as a learning exercise, but also as a motivator to new writers. And I think it's invaluable. Number six, I hate outlines. I have a broad sense of where the story's going. I know the end, but I don't necessarily know each twist and turn along the way. Yep, me too. I struggle to outline and I find it really doesn't help me at all. However, this one I just think comes down to whatever helps you wrestle your story into some semblance of order. I personally really like just having a vague idea of where the story's going. I always know the end, but everything leading up to that is subject to change. I like having the capacity to surprise myself. However, in real life, I hate that approach to pretty much everything. So can't really work that one out. Number seven, I don't write the chapters in the order that you read them. Hmm. Writing out of order like that is not something that's ever occurred to me to try. I can see the potential benefits though. Say you're stuck in one character's perspective and it's not going anywhere. You can just switch to another further down the line and keep up your momentum. That makes sense. I might try this next time I start a novel and get bored halfway through. I am writing a story backwards at the moment though, which is in some way similar. Video about it up there. Number eight, all fiction, if it's successful, is going to appeal to the emotions. I definitely agree with this one too. Much like the second tip, stories being about people, you've got to know how those people feel. The best kind of writing, in my opinion, is the stuff that stays with you and is more than just there to entertain you in the moment. Writing just to entertain, of course, does still appeal to the emotions though. You don't have to feel moved by a story, you can feel excited or frightened or comfy. It's all emotions. Number nine. I think ultimately the battle between good and evil is weighed within the individual human heart. Seems true to me. This is a stuff of origin stories and villains you can empathise with and protagonists that you can't. Stories about flawed people that don't know who they are. Sounds a lot more interesting to me than pure good and pure evil having a bit of a fight. That fight, to some extent, should be within every character in the book. They should all have elements of light and dark. That's what creates those kinds of stories that, while you're reading, makes you think about who you're empathising with and why that might be. It makes you think of the good and evil inside yourself. Number 10, be ready to accept rejection. You can work on a book for two years and get it published and it's like you may as well have thrown it down a well. This seems like good advice as well. Rejection is just one of those things you have to build up a resistance to. The first few times it happens, it can really knock your confidence, but once you get used to it, you find rejections hurt less and less. That's certainly how it's been for me anyway, and now I get so many rejections back and none of them hurt at all. I might not be doing this right. The point is, feeling discouraged about getting rejections is totally normal, but as long as it doesn't stop you writing or stop you sending out another piece of work, then you're fine. Here's a bonus tip from George R.R. R. Martin too. Writing's like sausage making in my view. You'll all be happier in the end if you just eat the final product without knowing what's gone into it. If you like your writing advice with a tinge of weird magic, then you've come to the right place. He is, of course, an award-winning author of both short fiction and novels. Some of this stuff's paraphrased, but the meaning's still the same. Here's a bunch of Haruki Murakami's writing advice. Number one, reflect on what you see. Don't rush into judgment about it. The way I read this advice is that if you're trying to make a point with what you're writing, 
Try not to be really obvious about it. You can stand on a soapbox if you want, but just don't scream into people's face while you do it. No one's going to listen to that, and your point probably isn't going to get heard. Instead, offer reflections, like he says. If you're looking to right a wrong or bring something to your reader's attention using your story, then present that thing exactly as it is. Let everything that's wrong about it be plain to see. You then don't have to stand next to something and go, that's wrong. Drawing someone in with the power of story and allowing them to come to the conclusion themselves that you are in fact correct is a far more effective way of getting your points across. No reader likes the feeling that they're being herded or corralled into one particular opinion or observation, but if you take a reader on a journey and let them see things out of the window that make them think or feel something, then you'll stand a much greater chance of reaching them. Reflect on things instead of being really blunt with what you're writing. It's always good advice. Number two, avoid working on anything else while you're writing a story. I don't know if I agree with this one, or I don't. I agree with working on whatever you feel most inspired and most driven to work on when you feel like working on it. But I also strongly believe you should finish things. Ultimately, I think the point about finishing things is the more important one, because without that, there are no stories. No one wins any awards or hits any bestseller lists with half a first draft. So I think in that way, focusing on one story at a time does make sense. Push through it, get it written, get it finished. Take all of the learning that you can from that particular story, squeeze all the experience out of it, and then take that and move on. Write another story. Better. Murakami's won me over. Write one story at a time, I'm on board. Having said that though, if you find yourself in the position where you can't make any more progress on your current story, and you've given it your true, honest, best effort and you've just got nowhere to go, then by all means, change it up, write something different. It's gotta be fun, that's the most important thing. Number three, the key component is not the quality of the materials, it's the magic. If the magic is there in a story, even the ordinary can become extraordinary. Big fat massive agree on this one as well, I'm all about the pursuit of magic when it comes to writing. We can learn techniques and skills and all manner of tools that help us to shape ideas into stories when we get them, but where do those ideas come from in the first place? Magic, exactly. I'm glad we're on the same page. And I agree with what he said, the key component there really isn't the quality of the materials. Nice writing doesn't make a story by itself. A fantastic plot doesn't make a story by itself. A combination of those two and a bunch of other storytelling chunks can still combine to make something lukewarm and lifeless. A story can be complete and have everything that it needs on paper, no pun intended, and still feel like it's just missing something because it has no magic. Trust me, I've written several novels like that. If a book has magic, then the everyday can become extraordinary, like he said. An idea that everybody's seen before can suddenly seem brand new. You just have to find that magic and harness it. And how do you do that? I'm actually asking, I'm asking you, I, I don't know, I'd really like to know. Number four, before the magic, first comes your garage. Magic can't work if your garage is empty. Well, here's a place to start at least anyway. And if this advice sounds a little bit strange to you, let me tell you what I think it means. I recently made some videos about Neil Gaiman's writing advice, links in the description, and he called this the compost heap rather than the garage, but I think it's the same concept. It's a place for writers to store ideas and halves of ideas and scraps of that magic that you haven't figured out what to do with yet. It's a place to put ideas in waiting, shiny things that you know are gonna be useful even if you haven't quite figured out how yet. I think by having a place like that, either in your mind or on paper or on your phone, you're far more likely to catch those little sparks of magic. You have to be open to them or ready for them. Or better yet, you have to be looking for them. So become an active participant in how that magic reaches you. You'll find glimpses of it in stuff that you read and stuff that you watch, music you listen to and in snatches of conversation. Follow it, track it down, shove it in the garage. It will come in handy later. Number five, focus on exactly who it is you're aiming to reach. The intended audience should not be as many people as possible. This makes sense in a couple of different ways, the first one being your actual literal audience. If you wanna write and sell books and you're looking to be successful in the commercial side of writing, then having a target audience is probably a really good idea. It's probably something that business-minded people might call a strategy. For me, I don't really wanna do that. While I want to make a career for myself in writing, I don't wanna do that just through book sales, so that's not really a big part of my strategy. The other way that this advice speaks to me is in what I'm writing. 
When I write stories or flash fiction or whatever it is, I won't have an exact audience in mind. I'll definitely won't know demographics or anything that specific. However, that doesn't mean that when I finish a story, I sit and look at it and think, absolutely everyone on earth should read this. Because that's never true for any story or any writer ever. Definitely the case for me. There will always be people that don't like what you write. And there'll also be people that do like it, but will have to be convinced to even give your writing a try in the first place. Like this guy. <sighs> right, what's the matter with you? I don't know. I'm just really bored. Well, read something then. Like what? Flash fiction? No, too short. A novella then? Too long. How about an awkward mix of the two, which ultimately satisfies neither? Keep talking. Okay, so it's a literary crime story that traces the path of a stolen car through this criminal landscape of a rural town. Maybe. Yeah, you can check it out at kieranwestwood.com forward slash books, or just go direct to Amazon. It's ebook and paperback. Yeah, all right. There you go, weird alter ego. Don't say I never do anything for you. Knowing that your writing isn't gonna be for everyone and embracing that is a step in your writing development that I think is overlooked. It means to some extent you can be free of thinking about what you should write or what might sell or what people might wanna see or what people think you should write and instead start writing what you feel most inspired to or at least as much as it's ever possible to do that. That might seem really unrealistic, especially if you wanna make a lot of money writing books. But my opinion, and it is just that, is that I'd rather read a book written by an author who felt passionate about their story than one that assessed market trends, looked at forecasts, assessed graphs, and then wrote something intended to reach as many people as possible. And those two things are not mutually exclusive by any means, but if they were, I'd definitely fall on the side of the inspiration. Number six, there is no substitute for repetition. In running terms, the more you do it, the more you build the right muscles to get you from one place to the next in the quickest and most effective way. I agree with this point, but if I could be so bold, I would change the word repetition to perseverance. The spirit in which this is intended, I think is practice, keep writing, write regularly, and that's always good advice. Over time, like the muscles that Murakami talks about, your skills and your abilities as a writer will slowly grow. And you might not notice massive gains from one writing session, but those things will slowly build over time until you're buff. Things that were very difficult to start with suddenly don't feel that difficult anymore. And things that were outright impossible when you first started now seem attainable. It's always worth targeting specific weak areas in your writing. I think that's how you develop quickest as a writer. But as long as you keep writing and you finish things, you'll keep improving and your writing stamina will build. You'll also work towards developing your voice and you'll rely less on your influences and your writing will start to support its own weight, all from just sitting down and writing. It's not easy to do, but it is a simple concept. Write more, get good. Good, get better. Number seven, take the old words, and make them new again. He compares this concept to playing a musical instrument. There are only so many notes you can play, but if you mean a note enough, it'll sound different. He says you've got to pick the notes that you really mean. As writers, as original as our stories might be, there's always gonna be an example of something similar or something comparable out there that somebody's already written. I've heard it said somewhere before that there are only 10 types of story in existence. And while I really don't like that kind of ceaseless categorization, I do tend to agree that stories and ideas are somewhat limited. What is less limited is what the author brings to it, their own personality and idiosyncrasies, their own approach and viewpoint. It's true that story ideas may repeat, but no one can tell your story exactly the way you can. No one has the same viewpoint formed in exactly the same way. Nobody sees quite the same parts of the story from the same angle. So if you're worried that your story idea isn't original enough, I'd say write the thing first before you pass judgment on it. Number eight, share your dreams. Dreaming is a day job of novelists, but sharing our dreams is a still more important task for us. 
We cannot be novelists without this sense of sharing something. I can take this advice in two ways, I think. The first way I think is Murakami telling us writers to go all in. Don't write the safe story or the story that you know you can write. Write the kinds of stories that made you want to write in the first place. That perfect idea, that perfect book that you've always wanted to read, write that. I think doing that is sharing a dream. It's writing something that you're invested in and that means something to you. And that kind of intention, I think, is visible in the pages. It comes out in the writing. And the second way I think you can take this advice is a little bit more literally. Share your dream. Tell people that you're writing or that you want to be a writer. Get comfortable with sharing that part of your life. It's not an easy thing to do because some people might meet it with skepticism or doubt, but that's okay. Talk to the people who express an interest, the ones who ask questions, and most of all, talk to other writers. Sharing the dream that way, I feel, helps you feel a little bit closer to it helps it feel a little more likely to actually come true. The next one's a bit weird. Number nine, right on the side of the egg. I told you. I'll elaborate. It's not about actually physically writing on the side of an egg. That's what my literal brain heard the first time I read it, but the full piece of advice reads like this. Between a high, solid wall and an egg that breaks against it, I will always stand on the side of the egg. Yes, no matter how right the wall may be and how wrong the egg, I'll stand with the egg. So really we're talking about story and character here and the angle from which you choose to approach them. To reduce its nuance to a very blunt point, everybody loves an underdog. For the vast majority of people, it's far more interesting and relatable to read about the struggles of an everyday person than the unbeatable glory of an overwhelming power like Amazon. Seemingly improbable odds and unlikely victories are much better routes to creating drama and tension and that makes your story more interesting. Even if you know full well that good will eventually win out, it's still more interesting to see exactly how that victory comes about than to just watch a victory of something that has power and uses power and wins. The brick wall in Murakami's analogy. This is also a useful tip for approaching characterization as well. Try thinking of your main character as the egg instead of the wall, and it might give you a bit more perspective and allow for a bit of character development that you might not have initially seen. You can start with an egg and have it hatch into something entirely different. If you happen to have seen any of my writing advice from famous authors videos before, then you might know that I usually go and find quotes from writers ahead of time and prepare some thoughts on them for the video. This time, I'm gonna do it a little bit different. We're doing it live. I found Zadie Smith's 10 rules for writing in an article the other day, which I'll link down below. I read her debut novel, White Teeth, a couple of years ago. I've also read her novel, Swing Time, and I enjoy them both. And I also enjoy listening to her thoughts on writing in a couple of podcasts that I've listened to. So what I thought I would do is read Zadie Smith's 10 rules of writing and just talk about what I think they mean off the cuff. So let's get started. So number one is when still a child, make sure you read a lot of books. Spend more time doing this than anything else. I mean, if you have the hindsight to think of that while you're still a child and you know you want to be a writer, then absolutely this advice applies. But I think generally it's kind of more of a retroactive thing. I think kids who read a lot tend to be writers more than kids who don't read at all. Maybe I'm just making that up completely. Who knows? I read quite a bit when I was a kid. I had a huge stack of those Goosebumps books, if anybody remembers those. Or maybe I just sound like a boomer at this point. But I was always reading those and then when I got to a teenager I was reading Harry Potter and other stuff and I never really stopped reading since then and now I just read when I have the time but I think it's definitely a good idea to read a lot when you're a kid because you develop that sense of imagination and if you're a creative person as well it sort of gives you an idea of it plants the seed of creativity in your mind and makes you think oh other people can write stories maybe I can too so I definitely agree with that piece of advice. Number two, when an adult, try to read your own work as a stranger would read it, or even better, as an enemy would. I think that's great advice. I especially love the little twist at the end of reading your stuff how an enemy would. What a great way to shore up your writing and make sure it's watertight and it, it has no gaps in it because you know an enemy would point out every single thing that's wrong with what you've written. Reading your own writing as if you're a stranger, I think is always good advice, though it's really difficult to do. 
it gives you perspective and it lets you see things differently than you did initially when you were writing it. You get out of that writing mode that occupies your mind while you're crafting a story and then you get into the, the mind of a reader that sees things differently. It's difficult to do, but the only way I know to do it is to just leave stuff for ages until I get out of that writing mindset and I forget all those pathways and all those connecting things linking the story together and I see them as if they were somewhat new. You never really forget everything, I don't think. Well, I've got quite a bad memory, so I do, but most people probably won't forget everything, but you can at least get a little bit of distance from it and that's when some of the most useful editing happens, I think. Number three, don't romanticize your vocation. You can either write good sentences or you can't. There is no writer's lifestyle. All that matters is what you leave on the page. Yes, hard agree on this. My wife Haley bought me a book a while ago called Working On My Novel. And all the book is, is a collection of tweets of people who say they were working on their novel. I think there's a lot of posturing that goes on as well, to be harsh. I'm not usually so negative. I'm usually more of a positive person, but there's so many people that love talking about writing but not actually writing. They don't perhaps love the hard work that goes into it. They just love feeling like they can tell people they're writing a novel and those people will be impressed. But the thing is, most of the time, they're not that impressed anyway. Number four, avoid your weaknesses, but do this without telling yourself that the things you can't do aren't worth doing. Don't mask self-doubt with contempt. I don't really agree with this one as much. In fact, I quite often talk about directly addressing your weaknesses as a way to improve your writing. I do agree with the point she said about do this without telling yourself that the things you can't do aren't worth doing. It's definitely not a good idea to assign no value to things that you just can't do. If you're no good at putting subtext into a book, you can't just decide that it doesn't need it. I've tried to do that before when I was writing my first novels and I didn't plan them whatsoever and I wrote them completely off the cuff. I decided that planning wasn't necessary and that it wasn't going to help me at all and that I just wasn't a planner and the novels didn't go so well. Though I'm not a complete planner and an outliner at all, I need to have some idea of where I'm going so I stay on track. So just deciding that that doesn't immediately work for me right now, therefore it has no value, is a pretty bad idea. So if you've got anything in your writing that you think, yeah, but I don't really need that, you do need that and you should learn it because that's going to help you improve really quickly and it will be worth learning as well. Number five, leave a decent space of time between writing something and editing it. Yeah, that's always good advice, I think. And it links in with number two about reading your own writing like a stranger would. What exactly a decent time is, is anyone's guess. I suppose it would depend writer to writer. For me, I get itchy to go back to something and finish it because I'm impatient. So I don't often leave a huge amount of time between things. If it's a micro fiction or a flash fiction, I don't really leave any time at all. And because those are so short, if I left a week between them, I could come back and have a great, well, uh, uh, quite a lot of insight compared with if I wrote a novel and came back to that in a week, you, that's not really enough distance for me. The approach I would take for this is if you finish something, leave it for a week, read it again. If you're still super familiar with it, then leave it for longer, leave it for longer until you find out what the ideal is for you. And that might differ with every single project. It probably will for me. I'm always talking about how nothing stays level with me. Every different project, everything needs a different approach. That's just writing to me. It's always changing. The goalposts are always moving. Number six, avoid clicks, gangs, and groups. The presence of a crowd won't make your writing any better than it is. Interesting. I don't agree with this one necessarily either because a big mistake I made with writing was not talking about writing with anyone ever. And I know I just slated people that talk about hashtag writing and all that stuff, uh, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is talking about what you are doing, actively doing with people who are also doing it. So writers groups and other stuff like that. I run my own writers discord, by the way. So there's a link to that probably down below if you want to join that. Talking at least to one or two other writers is the best way to sometimes get feedback, sometimes stay engaged with your writing and figure out that you're not actually out of your mind trying to do this at all. When you're writing on your own and you're not talking to anyone and you don't have anyone really that understands what you're trying to do or why you might be trying to do it, that's when I think demotivation can hit and you can stay in patterns where you're not advancing because no one's there to tell you you're repeating something or you're making the same mistake over and over again. So being part of groups and stuff, I think is useful because it's useful to give people 
advice about their own writing or insight about their own writing as well because it helps you build your editing skills at the same time. Stuff like NaNoWriMo though, I don't personally find it useful to try and write so much in a short time. Some of that or a massive part of that is the community feel of it. It's everyone coming together to try to achieve something. And I think that can't be a bad thing. But at the same time, there are such things as bad writers groups where you know there's bad blood or there's not useful feedback. I've definitely heard of that happening. I've come across it a couple of times myself. I'm a hugely introverted person, he says, making a video on YouTube, but I am. I still need to interact with other people in order to help improve my writing. That one's down to you, but I would say err on the side of finding people to talk to if you possibly can. I think it's probably worth doing. Number seven, work on a computer that is disconnected from the internet. This is all about distraction, I suppose. Um, I don't need to do this, but I'm focusing on short fiction at the moment. So it doesn't take an extended effort of hours to craft something for me. I can write a first draft of a hundred word story in, like, in about 10 minutes and then it's just, improving it and making sure it works and all that stuff and as for a flash fiction it usually takes me about an hour to write one of those i don't tend to get distracted if i'm in the middle of writing something i do find that i'll open up a browser window or something but I, i'm quite disciplined and i'll just close it and continue what i'm doing because i know it's not going to benefit me right here and there right here and now towards the story i know that you know looking at my youtube analytics isn't going to help at this exact moment so i've learned to stop doing that but just disconnecting the computer from the internet can't be a bad thing because it just takes that choice out of your hands entirely. Whatever you gotta do to concentrate in this atmosphere of 60 second content that's endlessly browsable and swipeable, it's really difficult to concentrate on stuff sometimes. I myself, I'm a victim of cat videos on TikTok. I understand how it feels. But sometimes, You've just got to know that or focus on the fact that you'll feel great when you finish doing what you're doing and you make a good job of it. That's what I always focus on and that's what keeps me disciplined, I think. Number eight, protect the time and space in which you write. Keep everybody away from it, even the people who are most important to you. Again, I think this is personal preference. To me, I don't have a time and space in which I write. Sometimes I write on my laptop. Sometimes I write here at the desk. It's never at the same time of day. Depends when the mood strikes me because I am writing such short bursts and not working on a novel. When I'm working on a novel, I do tend to stick to the same time and space and stuff. But the point about protecting it from other people, it kind of goes with the avoiding clicks and gangs and stuff that she talks about before. But I think it, it for me, I can write with my wife in the room with me because she understands what I'm doing and she doesn't think I'm a weirdo. But I can definitely understand wanting to get away from everybody to do it, especially if everybody that's around you isn't necessarily connected with writing. I can understand wanting to find a space that's safe and quiet to get on with your work and not be distracted. That makes a lot of sense. I don't think there's anything wrong with running away to a quiet space and working on something creative like that. Number nine, don't confuse honors with achievement. This isn't something that I have a great deal of experience in, but I'll interpret it as well as I can. I think what she's saying is don't think because you win an award or you get something published that you're the best writer the world has ever seen. I suppose don't let things go to your head because a lot of that stuff, awards and publication and anything else in writing really is subjective and based on opinion. You can never really achieve something beyond the shadow of a doubt. You can never be like, that person is objectively the best at what they do. It just doesn't really exist. The word achievement to me, I think is an internal thing. Achievements for me are personal goals that I set and don't necessarily talk about or mention that much. And the, the satisfaction comes from just doing them, not from someone giving you an award or some external validation of some kind. In terms of honors, I mean, I've been shortlisted for a few competitions before um, for some flash fiction and some short stories and stuff. And I'm also gonna have a flash fiction published in a journal, but that stuff doesn't give me the same kind of satisfaction as those internal achievement goals, if that makes sense. Finishing a book, even though nobody's read it, is far more satisfying to me than someone else saying, this is good and, and we like it. So I think, to survive and to keep writing, those internal achievements 
are the important ones that you need to constantly motivate yourself with. I think that, that is where the satisfaction for this comes from. That's where the longevity in writing will come from. You can't depend on receiving outside honors in any way. You have to find that fuel from within yourself and not take it from outside sources because you can't depend on any of that. But you can depend on how you feel and the personal goals that you set. Number 10, tell the truth through whichever veil comes to hand, but tell it. Resign yourself to the lifelong sadness that comes from never being satisfied. If that isn't the craft of writing summed up in a couple of sentences, then I don't know what is. For me, the first thing that comes to mind reading that is just how inaccurate words are and how difficult it is to make the point that you're really trying to make. As honest as you might be trying to be about it, it's just so difficult. Sure, I've probably talked about this in videos before, but if only I could write exactly what I imagine my story to be and just sit and it comes out exactly like that. If only that were the case, it just isn't. It, reality brings about 60 to 80% of that if you're lucky or if I'm lucky, that's, that's how it turns out for me. I can create something that vaguely resembles what I hoped it would and I can just hope that it carries that emotional weight or of that truth that she talks about. It doesn't work the first time and you think, well, maybe the next time I can get, I can just sum up everything that I want to say with this and it'll be perfectly accurate. And it might be a little bit more accurate, but it's never going to be 100% because language is just too limited. You can't create a feeling from writing in the same way that you would feel it with your brain chemicals and all that business. It's just impossible. How do you describe nostalgia? How do you describe a colour. You just can't do it. Language just doesn't have the dexterity to enable you to pass on meaning like that to a, write, to a reader. So you just have to be satisfied with giving the general impression, I suppose. And it is unsatisfying, but you soon learn that 80% is really 100%. And 100% is just not possible. If you've been around my channel for a while, you'll know how much I love short fiction. And um, Raymond Carver was an absolute master of the short story. He also wrote poetry too, but I'm gonna focus on the fiction for this video. His collection Cathedral was the first one of his that I read back when I was at university. And what immediately struck me about his writing was how minimal but insightful it was. He had this way of writing about normal people with normal lives in a way that's anything but boring or humdrum. There'll be a huge amount we can learn from him, so let's get on with Raymond Carver's advice for writers. Number one, a little autobiography and a lot of imagination are best. This advice seems so straightforward and almost obvious when you first read it, but what I like about it is that it can be applied to all writers. If you're the kind of writer with a wealth of life experiences that you can draw upon and bring into your writing, then you can kind of lead with some of that experience. You'll be able to pull story from reality in a way, but just be careful you don't go too far because then you'll cross the line and it'll stop being fiction. There has to be a good amount of imagination in there as well to weave in some magic or present the unbelievable and to surprise your readers. On the other side of this, if you don't have the most life experience, especially I think this applies to younger writers, then the temptation is to shield yourself with that fantastic imagination, to create a story from nothing with no real connection to reality or your own life at all. When I was new to writing, that's exactly what I tried to do. I tried to hide my lack of life experience, as I saw it, with a creative and inventive story, and it didn't work. The story ended up feeling flat and inauthentic and it had no life. And it wasn't that I didn't know enough about the setting so it didn't feel real or that I hadn't done enough research into what the story was about so that that didn't bring it to life. It wasn't that stuff. The problem was that to protect against the story being boring, I didn't put any of myself into it whatsoever. There was nothing about how I saw the world. There was no trace of me in that story. And I don't mean write yourself into the story as an actual character, by the way. I just mean the story has to be yours and it has to come from your unique perspective. You can't be a human printer and just output a story like that. A bit of yourself always has to come out with any story that you write in order for it to have any life at all. You might think that nothing story worthy has ever happened to you. That's definitely what I thought at that time and what a privilege that is, I should mention. But that's not what this advice means, I don't think. 
Carver doesn't mean write about that time you fell over in the street and you felt embarrassed. I think he means weave what matters to you, what you see and feel and think about the world into your stories alongside the plot that you've imagined. In my opinion, that's what gives writing life. Number two, get in, get out, don't linger, go on. This advice came from an interview that Raymond Carver did with the New York Times in 1981 and it struck such a chord with me when I read it that I knew I had to include it. He talks about a phase in his writing when he was having such a hard time concentrating on even reading longer work, never mind writing it. Which is exactly how I feel about my own writing at the moment. The tip, get in, get out, don't linger, go on, applies to all writing I think. There's a very practical way that it can be useful to you when you're writing stories, but there's also a more abstract way that it can be helpful. The practical side of this, I think, is useful in approaching individual stories. My mantra for creating a story or any kind of writing, really, is write, learn, repeat, and I think it's a similar kind of concept. It's about finishing things. It's about getting an idea, following that idea through to completion, finishing it, learning from it, and moving on. So much of what slowed me down when I was new to writing, and still does to this day, is assessing my own writing too much. Which, when you think about it, is exactly what this channel is. I'm always thinking, is this finished? Is this good? Is there something I can add to it? There's nothing wrong with editing. Editing is in fact essential. But I'm talking about those times where you're just tinkering with your writing. You change a sentence, add something, take it out, delete the whole thing, and you end up saving the document exactly as it was before. I think that kind of thing is rooted not in wanting to make the story better, but in just a reluctance to share the writing and put it out there and call it finished. That, as I see it, is the practical side of this advice, but I think it also applies to the whole craft in a more abstract way as well. Get in, get out, don't linger, go on, I think is a good mantra for all of writing. I'm always talking about making your point with what you write, whether that be something so simple that you initially overlooked it or something more bold and ambitious. That mantra, I think, could keep me on track when I'm making that point and remembering what's important about the story. Get in, don't hesitate to make your point and don't talk around it. Get out. Once you've made your point, be confident that it's made. Don't linger. Don't endlessly tinker with what you've written. Don't labor your point. Go on, take what you've learned, and start working on something else. In my opinion, whether it's the point that you make or what's actually happening in your scene, not lingering and instead moving on, I think is good advice for pretty much everything in writing. Number three, writers don't need tricks or gimmicks. I'm against tricks which call attention to themselves in an effort to be clever or merely devious. I love this point. If you've seen any of my videos, you'll know my approach to writing is all about finding a way to affect a reader or connect with them in some way. Tricks and gimmicks, as far as I'm concerned, won't really help you do that. I've absolutely used them myself, by the way. I've planned an entire novel around one clever twist at the end without really realizing I was hoping that that twist would carry the entire book. It didn't. There's nothing wrong with twists and cleverness in writing, by the way, but I just don't think that stuff can make up the majority of a book. I think there has to be something more to it. I talk about the heart of a story a fair bit, and I know that sounds a bit lofty and pretentious, I'm aware, but I genuinely do think there has to be one. If you want to use tricks and gimmicks, I think the weight of the story should already be there. It should be able to support its own weight first before you add that stuff in. Then those tricks, if you want them, can just be embellishments to a story that already feels whole. I think what it boils down to is what you're looking for from your writing or your story. I'm looking to give a reader some kind of experience or make them feel a certain way, leave a lasting impression on them or just make them think about things. I don't know if tricks and gimmicks can really do that. Number four, I'm not interested in works which are all texture and no flesh and blood. I guess I'm old fashioned enough to feel that the reader must somehow be involved at the human level. Well, if that was old fashioned in 1985 at the time of that interview, then I'm seriously out of date at this point because I strongly agree with this. I have no interest in stories that don't make readers feel anything at all. This one goes hand in hand with the last one really, in that it's all about what you're hoping to achieve with your writing. And I think that's something that's well worth stopping to consider from time to time. And I mean really stop and think about it. My aim, as simply as I can put it, is as Carver says, to involve my reader at a human level. I wanna make a reader feel something. Thinking about why you do it, I think can give you a lot of direction with your writing. When you figure out what your actual goal is, underneath selling books and getting published, what is it really? I find that can give you answers that you didn't know you needed. 
and it can also help you avoid writing for the wrong reasons, even if those reasons are just wrong for you personally. What's the flesh and blood beneath it all? Number five, there has to be tension, a sense that something is imminent, that certain things are in relentless motion, or else, most often, there simply won't be a story. I like this point as soon as I read it, although I do think I interpreted it wrong the first time. I write literary crime stories mainly, so tension is something that I'm usually looking to create. I often want it to be a part of my stories, so naturally that's what I thought he was talking about. The slow build up to a conflict, or how a plot or a situation can slowly get more dangerous. All of that's still true, I think, and if you write in a genre where tension would fit, then it definitely still applies. But I don't think he necessarily means tension as in conflict. I think the tension he's talking about is the kind you find in elastic. The kind of tension that comes from things wanting to change shape, or from stretching things out. All stories, I think, benefit from being stretched out or closely looked at or tested to see if they hold their shape. And the phrase relentless motion is a great way to sum up what should always be happening with any story. It should always be moving forward, making progress, working towards something. There always has to be a force that's pulling it on or driving it forward, no matter what kind of genre you're writing in or what you want the speed of your story to be. A sense of something being imminent. I can't really think of a better way to make a reader turn a page than that. Number six, if you're going to describe a spoon or a chair or a TV set, you don't want to simply set these things into the scene and let them go. You want to give them some weight, connecting these things to the lives around them. I really couldn't agree more, and if there's one thing that I can't hide my dislike for in writing, it's description for the sake of description. And I know some readers love that, and they absolutely want that in stories, but I'm not one of them. I definitely agree with what Carver says here. Everything you put into your story should have at least some small reason to be there. Everything should contribute towards the story, even if it's in the tiniest of ways. To clarify, it's a mistake, in my opinion, to spend loads of time describing objects when they have no real bearing on the story. But that doesn't mean that every single thing that you describe has to be absolutely involved in the plot in some way. That's also a mistake. That spoon he mentioned, for example, it doesn't have to sit on a table until the point where it's used as a murder weapon against someone. Ouch. That's not the kind of connection to the story that I think he's talking about. Instead, I think the things that you mention and describe just have to feel like they're a part of the lives of your characters. They're in some ways an extension of your characters rather than just pieces of your setting. The setting, as much as you might love it, is not alive. It's not a character. So furnishing it with a great number of accessories that don't really interact with anything isn't going to create much of an effect. However, associating objects and things with your characters can carry weight. There can be memories associated with them or value to them. When they sit somewhere disconnected, just being shiny, there's not really any sense of that. When you describe things, I think is also really important. Listing a bunch of stuff at the opening of a story or the opening of a chapter, not only is that a little bit boring in my opinion, but it's also ahead of the characters. It's ahead of the reason you're writing the scene. It's ahead of the story. Even for the most important of objects, I think describing them when a character interacts with them is what gives them purpose. It's what helps connect them to the lives of the characters, as Carver says. Someone feeling the weight of a dagger in their hand has way more life to it than that dagger just sitting on a table. Number seven, it's important for writers to provide enough to satisfy readers even if they don't provide the answers or clear resolutions. This is really good advice, I think, because it takes into account different types of writers. I'm not the kind of writer that likes to specify in great detail what the outcome of my story is. If you've read anything that I've written, like my novella in Flash, Gold Fury, which I'll link down below, then you'll know I prefer to leave the outcomes of my story a bit more open. Some readers, like me, will really like that. They enjoy the fact that everything isn't wrapped up into a neat little package and there's space there for you to imagine and they like that feeling of being left wondering. Some readers though will hate that and that's absolutely valid too. If they're investing their time and their money and their energy into reading a story, then they wanna know how things turned out. You're the writer, tell them what happened. You can never please every reader and it's probably not a great idea to try, but what you can do is try to please as many readers as possible while staying true to the kind of writer that you are. I think that's what Carver is alluding to here. 
providing enough to satisfy readers. It depends on the genre too. You can't very well write a whodunit mystery and at the end say, it's open to interpretation. You decide who did it. Because readers are going to feel pretty cheated by that and probably throw your book at the wall. But with a literary fiction book, you can leave that ending wide open if you want to. I think what it boils down to isn't the amount of detail or the amount of loose ends you tie up or you don't. It's the shape of the ending. It might not be airtight, corner to corner with everything boxed off, but it should at least occupy enough space at the end of that story to feel like an unquestionable ending. The first rule of writing advice is you don't talk about writing advice. However, that's sort of what my channel's all about, so I'm gonna do it anyway. In this video, I'm talking about Chuck Polanik's writing advice. Yes, I did Google how to pronounce that. Nobody seems to know. So I gave it my best shot. He of course wrote Fight Club, loads of other novels and some short fiction too. Here's some of his writing advice. Number one, when you don't want to write, set an egg timer for an hour or half an hour and sit down to write until the timer rings. I've got a couple of videos on my channel that sort of touch on this. They're about what produces better writing, inspiration or perspiration. And I see the perspiration side of this is what he's talking about, not wanting to write. And it's interesting, as of right now, I don't know what the outcome of those videos was. I don't know what won because I'm recording before I finish the experiment. But I think, in my opinion, when I really don't feel like writing at all, I tend to feel like I'm producing writing that isn't as good. However, that is just my opinion. Not all writers work like that. Career authors, I'm sure, will sit down when they've got deadlines and they will write something because they've got to make progress and they've got to be productive and get it done. And I totally get that. So in this sense, I think setting an egg timer and just doing it, just pushing all that choice out of your mind and just getting on with it makes sense. The idea of writing for half an hour or an hour is a lot more manageable and realistic than sitting and looking at something and thinking, I have to write this whole chapter today or I want to write this many pages or this many words. I think just giving it half an hour's solid effort or an hour's solid effort is a good target to hit. In a sense, it's a target you can't really miss because even if you stare at a blank screen for all that time and you don't get all that much done, you still put the time in and you were still trying. Whereas you can't really say that with a word count target. If you aim for a thousand words and you write 20, it feels like you really failed. But just giving some concentrated effort for a certain amount of time, you can't really fail at that. So in a way, I can see how that would be useful, though I probably wouldn't do this with my own writing. Number two, your audience is smarter than you imagine. Don't be afraid to experiment with story forms and time shifts. This is a problem in my own writing, but not quite from the direction that he's talking about. I tend to over explain when I'm writing stuff, especially when the something in the plot depends on an understanding of what I've just written. I'll go into too much detail with it and just hammer it home to make sure that the reader doesn't miss what I'm saying. And that's not out of an assumption that the audience isn't smart enough to realize what I'm talking about. It's actually more of an internal thing for me. Sometimes I feel like the clarity isn't there in my writing and I worry that I'm not getting my message across and that it'll make the, the plot or the story feel muddy and unclear and confusing. So sometimes I'll tend to overcomplicate things when in fact I don't probably need to do that at all. That's a common bit of feedback I get on my writing is you don't need to go into so much detail on this particular thing. And I don't mean description detail because I never do that, but I mean how things work. I don't need to get down to the microscopic level to make sure that everything flows as it should do. I can just back off a little bit and assume that the reader is gonna pick it all up because I don't doubt the intelligence of readers at all. And the funny thing is when I'm reading, I don't like everything to be spelled out to me. So I don't really know why I do it in my own writing, but I am working on improving that and I've got significantly better at it over the past year or so. Writing short fiction helps because you just don't have the word count for that. But just learning to back off a little bit and try to see things as your reader would see them and but not to try and take over their eyes and make sure they see exactly what you see, I think is a good thing to get a hold of with your writing in general. Number three, before you sit down to write a scene, mull it over in your mind and know the purpose of that scene. This is really good advice, I think, especially from someone like me that doesn't really plan that far ahead. It can definitely give you some direction and make you figure out where you wanna go or what the most important thing about this coming chapter or this coming story is. Sometimes, 
I get bogged down in the plot and I think of too much about what's going to happen in the plot and the story becomes something of a blueprint with no heart to it. Stopping to think about the feeling that you want to give to a reader, I suppose, is always a good idea. And I suppose it works for planners in the same way. If you've got your entire story planned out already, you know exactly where it's going to go. The obvious trap that you might fall into there is to just produce a blueprint of this is exactly what should happen and it happened, but it just doesn't feel right. That's what happens to me when I write off a very solid plan anyway. So the potentially that happens to other people. You write something that though accurate to your plan and what you wanted it to be, just doesn't feel like your writing or doesn't feel like the story that you wanted to tell. Stopping beforehand, even if you have that plan, to think about what matters most about it or what the important part of that chapter is, how it contributes to the overall theme or the overall feeling of your book, I think it's really solid advice. Number four, surprise yourself. If you can bring the story or let it bring you to a place that amazes you, then you can surprise your reader. I like this too, from a non-planner perspective, again, I do surprise myself with where my stories actually go. I have a general idea. I always know the ending, for example. Well, most of the time I know the ending, not always. But along the way, I just find the story and find that works for me. That keeps me feeling creative. It helps that if I have a new idea as I'm going along or I feel particularly inspired by something, I can weave that into it. I've got the option and the space to get that in. Whereas if I was writing off a plan, I probably wouldn't be able to do that quite as easily. I'd have to adjust more and move more stuff around. And that kind of thing tends to get pretty frustrating for me. I don't like administration while I'm trying to write a first draft. I like to just sit and write the first draft and have the first draft done. I don't like moving things around until the edit. And even then, I don't like doing it. Having said that, I don't think this advantage is unique to non-planners. I think you can surprise yourself even in the planning stages of your story, right? Because you're still discovering the story in exactly the same way. You're still asking yourself what needs to happen next. You're still coming across the same points in your story where you need to go in a certain direction. So you still have the option to surprise yourself. I think you're just surprising yourself there in the planning stages ahead of time rather than doing it in the middle of what you're writing. The same concept still applies. If you can surprise yourself, it'll translate to your reader. Number five, when you get stuck, go back and read your earlier scenes, looking for dropped characters or details that you can resurrect as buried guns. I don't really like to do this in my own writing. Like I said before, when I'm writing a first draft, I don't like to stop and move things around or anything. I like to just write the whole draft and have it done with. I do, however, still think there's value to this advice because those times where you do grind to a halt, but you're still in love with that story and you still want to finish it and you still know there's value to it, can be the most frustrating feeling. Maybe tracking back and finding a loose end that you didn't tie up correctly, or a wrong turn. I think I've said this in previous videos. Sometimes you have to wind back the clock on what you're writing. If you took a turn with a character, even if it seemed like the right thing to do at the time, doesn't necessarily mean it will lead you to the rest of the book as you see it. Sometimes you can write yourself into a corner without any idea you're doing it until it's too late. This suggestion of going back to look for dropped characters or details that you can resurrect as a buried gun seems like a good idea. It's perhaps an antidote to writer's block. If you get to the point where you've nothing further to write, it means you probably went wrong somewhere. For me, when I'm writing a story, the next part of the story is always coming to me. Sometimes I have to enter a few times and just write a quick note about where I'm going at the bottom, just so I don't lose that direction because it occurs to me as I'm writing what I'm already writing. And if that doesn't happen, there's usually a reason for that. It's usually a reason I don't immediately know where I'm going next. So that could be a missed turn. And going back to track back, read over stuff, seems like a good idea. However, what I would say is try not to do this too often. In fact, try not to do it unless you really can't help it and you've got nowhere to go with your story. I think tracking back chapter by chapter and reading over what you've done is gonna slow you down overall. It definitely does for me. I can only speak for myself, of course, as I always say, but if you know where you're going next with your story, keep going. Keep going for as long as you can and ride that wave of inspiration or energy, I suppose. I find something that a lot of new writers do is they'll write something and they'll immediately want to analyze it. Is this good? Am I doing the right thing? Where is this going? How could I do this better? And that's, it's, it's 
comes from a good place because you need to know how you're performing as a writer. You need to know what you do well, what you don't do well, and what you need to fix. However, it's so much information to take on at such an early stage that it's not gonna benefit you. It's just gonna lead you to analysis paralysis. I've got a video about that, I'll link up there. But keep going for as long as you can. Otherwise, you're gonna get bogged down in this stuff. However, like he says, if you get stuck, go back, reflect on something, find out where you went wrong. It's really good advice. Number six, the longer you can allow a story to take shape, the better that final shape will be. Don't rush or force the ending of a story or book. Yeah, I tend to agree with this actually. Even though I write very quickly, uh, really, because I'm focusing on short stuff right now and it doesn't take a long time to craft those stories in the same way that it might the outcome of a, of a long novel, I still think it's good to think a lot about what you're writing, about your story, about where it's going. This is another reason I don't like planning too much because I have to figure out all of this stuff far too quickly for me. I can't sit and point by point figure out how a story is going to go. I don't know necessarily how I'm going to reach the point just before the ending. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't know what the story is going to need to look like at that point. The way I approach writing novels when I'm actually writing them, which I haven't for a while, is I'll take it chronologically chapter by chapter and I might be as much as two or three chapters ahead in the little running plan that I keep going but I'll never really be any further ahead than that aside from the general shape of the ending. That said I suppose I can think about it in another way really. Even planners when they sit and plan out their story it's not brand new to them at that point. They don't just sit and think a story into existence and finish the plan and it's done. Likely, just the same as non-planners and every other writer, that story will have been going around their head for a, a while before they put pen to paper. So perhaps this is one of those things where you can do a lot of the work in your own mind before you ever sit down to start working on it. Perhaps this is one of those things that comes from that weird shadow place where ideas are stored and they just make their way to you either fully or half formed and your subconscious sometimes contributes into building it into a real idea that you can understand and comprehend. Whatever the case, I think the advice of giving a story plenty of time and plenty of thought is good advice. Number seven, don't give up. Not hugely specific advice, but it is advice that nevertheless always applies to writing. Writing's hard work and often you get no indication of all that hard work paying off in any way. And whatever your goals are for writing, whether you want to become published and have a career as an author, or you just want to write a story someone will enjoy, or just get rid of the story that's in your head, there's never any guarantee of success. However, if you do give up and you stop writing and you just forget about it, then you guarantee that you won't be successful. While there's no way to ensure you're gonna get what you want out of writing, there is absolutely a way to ensure that you don't. So just hold on, keep going, keep trying to learn things, don't give up. If you're anything like me, you might have moments where you think, why do I do this? Do I have any business doing this whatsoever? Is there any possibility that this will bring anything to me or pay off in any way? But the alternative is not doing anything at all and just that's not an option for me. In this series, I like to find writing advice from famous authors, read it, think about what it means and what we writers can learn from it. This ought to be a fun one because apparently Cormac McCarthy really hates giving writing advice and talking about writing. So I'm sure he'd be a big fan of the channel. But anyway, he is, of course, the author of a number of really successful books, a few of which I'm a really big fan of. I feel like I've learned quite a bit from reading his writing, but now I've found some tips as well, so I'll read those. Number one, I want, even for the worst of the characters, grace under pressure, some slinking nobility. If you've read any of Cormac McCarthy's writing before, then it seems like villains are something that he puts a great deal of thought into. I'm thinking about Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men or The Judge from Blood Meridian. There's definitely some slinking nobility and some grace under pressure with those characters and I think that's those are two attributes that we could definitely apply to our own villains as a general rule. The danger with villains I think is that they just come to represent all that's evil in the world that you've created or everything that's opposite of your hero and in doing that sometimes we can make those characters a little bit flat and two-dimensional, make them into caricatures rather than feeling like real people. And it's something of a cliche now to talk about grey characters or everyone having a mixture of light and dark to them but 
it's true. That is how people really are. No hero is ever completely good. No villain is ever completely bad. Being somewhere on that scale, maybe tipped more one way towards the other, just makes for more realistic characters. Not to mention something like Grace under pressure. When you think about it from a villain's perspective, it's gonna make them feel really creepy. As I said before, McCarthy's characters definitely have an element of this, and it makes them feel more formidable and more real as a challenge to your hero or to your protagonist. In a good versus evil story, most of the time I'm sure you'll agree that good is gonna prosper and the reader or the viewer or whoever is gonna know that good is gonna prosper eventually. The issue is that when your characters don't have this grace under pressure or this slinking nobility or when they don't feel like rounded characters, they also don't feel like any kind of competition. So all of the tension that you wanna build up between that good and evil just disappears because you know that this person is just a cardboard cutout that you're protagonist is just going to run straight through. So by allowing your villains to have more human attributes and things that we might perceive as good when applied to your hero, I think it just makes them more interesting, makes for a better story. I'm also a fan of giving villains positive attributes that your hero doesn't have. I think if you can make your readers consider where the moral compass of your character is pointing, then you're doing a pretty good job. They're invested. So yeah, I definitely agree with this point. Number two, creative work is often driven by pain. There's a couple of ways of looking at this, I think. The first is in terms of like subject matter for stories. A lot of people draw on traumatic events and terrible things. I mean, there's a real trend for post-apocalyptic stuff uh, in fiction in general across all media. And that's been like that now for a good few years. Stuff like that is always good story fodder, I suppose. The danger is though, that people will rely on that for story. Instead of trying to create value and meaning and impact themselves through their writing and through the actual story, they just say, this story is about this and expect the weight that that has in our real lives to translate immediately to the story. And that doesn't often work. You have to find some way of writing a story that works alongside that subject matter rather than just lying on top of it. Otherwise, the whole thing can feel a little bit inauthentic. The other way I think you could look at creative work is often driven by pain is through the creative process itself, through actual writing. I've heard a lot of people talk about writing is painful or writing is difficult, and that's absolutely the case. Whichever it was or whatever it was that McCarthy specifically had in mind when he made this quote, I think it pretty much applies either way and you can take it however you want. Whatever your reading is, I would say make sure to balance that dark with some light sometimes, whether you are thinking about your own creative process or you're thinking about your own story. Sustained pain over a long period of time is only gonna produce so much writing if you're talking about your creative process and it's only gonna keep your reader interested and keep a story going for so long if you're thinking about your story. Number three, it may be that if you don't have something in the back of your head driving you nuts, you may not do anything. Thing. This for me feels like a why do you write question and that's one that I struggle to answer myself and I talk about fairly often on this channel. I think there's always something in the background pushing you to get a story down on paper or to pursue writing as a pursuit day in day out. I don't always know what it is for me but there definitely feels like there's something. It feels like that deep-rooted reason for writing comes from the same place as story ideas. Like Things can come through that to you but you can't see through it. It's a mystery. However, I think as mysterious as it is, it's well worth sitting and thinking about because you may very well be able to decipher what motivates you as a writer. And if you can do that, it's probably gonna work really well in getting across your message with whatever you're writing. It's gonna assist you in doing that. It's just like a compass. It gives you direction, it's something to follow, and it's constant. And maybe some days you really don't know what the force is that drives you to writing. You don't really know what the point is. I definitely feel like that sometimes. I don't know what drives me day to day to keep doing this. I don't know where the energy comes from. I don't know why I just won't give up on certain stories. I have no idea, but it comes from somewhere. Whether you understand it or you don't, I think it's useful to have. But if you can get an idea of it, or if you can spend some time thinking about it, getting as close as you can to that, I think is always a good idea. Number four, I believe in periods, in capitals, in the occasional comma, and that's it. Controversial. A lot of people hate Cormac McCarthy's writing style because of this, because he doesn't use speech marks or exclamation points or, you know, anything other than the things that he just listed. Personally, I don't really mind too much. I find that 
The parts where you'd miss it the most is stuff like dialogue, but he does dialogue fairly sparingly and pretty well, so you usually don't lose track of who's talking to each other. Although there are definitely times where I do. I'm a minimalist kind of writer myself, but if I'm writing a novel, I put the actual punctuation that, in my opinion, the story needs into that for sure. However, when I'm writing microfiction, I don't use speech marks and other stuff like that. I just italicize dialogue. I don't know why. It just feels like it's neater uh, in a hundred word story to do that. I feel like it looks more whole somehow and it breaks up the story less. I don't know. Can't really explain it. But in flash fiction, I put all of my punctuation, everything goes into it. But there's a lot of stylistic choices like that in Cormac McCarthy's writing that I don't understand and that I am not a fan of. For example, in Blood Meridian and some of his other stories in this Border trilogy, which is like a Western cowboy type trilogy, there's large passages that are in Spanish, completely in Spanish and not translated. And while there's obviously nothing wrong with writing in the Spanish language, if you don't read Spanish or if you don't understand Spanish like me, you spend a lot of time putting things into Google Translate and that doesn't half take you out of the, the moment in a book. Perhaps I'm just speaking from a place of privilege being an English speaker, but it feels to me as though that's a choice that he's making and I don't often understand why that is. Also, I don't think it's a popular opinion that you don't need punctuation, that punctuation has no value or that it detracts from a story in any particular way. In terms of detracting from the story just by using basic punctuation, I don't really necessarily agree that that's a thing. In some very specific ways, I agree with dropping some punctuation from writing. Exclamation points, for example, I rarely use them. I don't like to see too many of them in stuff that I read because they just, they for some reason just take me out of the moment. I just can see the author behind them too much. However, I wouldn't apply that to the majority of punctuation. I think that's just there to facilitate us reading the story. It's to make it clearer. And clarity, I think, is always something good to aim for in your writing. So I don't necessarily agree with this piece of advice. However, if I'm writing a microfiction, I don't use speech marks. I don't know why. Number five, the ugly fact is books are made out of books. The novel depends for its life on the novels that have been written. Yeah, I agree with this. I think books definitely are made of books. I think books are also made of music and books are made of film and conversation you hear on the street. I've said it a lot of times on my channel by now. I'm sure you're sick of hearing it, but influences are what make your writing feel like you. And they're just things you soak up and you can't help but soak up. It's not like you can choose not to be influenced by something that you read and that you love. It's just unavoidable. And I think some writers worry far too much about originality. They'll assess a story before they've even written it based on whether anybody's written anything similar. Is the setting similar? Is the plot similar? The thing is, if you had that final piece of writing done, that whole story crafted, you probably have a lot of different ways that it's totally different from anything ever anyone's ever written before. However, beforehand going into it, all you're going to see is the things that are similar. There are no new stories in that respect. You can't create something totally original, or very few people can. I certainly can't. But I don't think we necessarily need to worry about that. Unless you're intentionally plagiarizing something, it's coincidence. I think being inspired by something and stealing something are just two totally separate things, and there's a line between them that no well-meaning author could ever cross without being aware of it. Separate authors could be given the same exact outline and write a totally different book. That's the difference, is what the author puts into it. The parts of themselves that they bring to the book, that's what make it different. And you can't avoid doing that. Just like you can't avoid writing in your own voice. It just happens it's a part of your process. I don't think it's likely that an author could take on another author's voice with such precision that it would be deemed plagiarism. You can be influenced as long as you're not stealing. And I think stealing is a choice, being influenced isn't. Number six, I never had any doubts about my abilities. I knew I could write. I just had to figure out how to eat while doing this. Must be nice. I worry about both of these things. I worry about the quality of my writing and how I'm getting on and how I'm developing as a writer. I also worry about ever making a living from doing this or ever making any kind of income from writing. In my opinion, I think a bit of self-doubt is a healthy thing for a writer. Without it, you might become overconfident in your work. You might miss your own mistakes or 
become ignorant to them even when people raise them to you. I think believing in yourself is one thing, and believing you're fantastic is entirely another. I don't think there's anything wrong with assessing yourself and figuring out how you can do something better, how you can learn from mistakes you've made before, or just build on what you can already do well. I think to just assume that, yeah, the, the inherent ability to write is there, I don't need to worry about that, I think that's dangerous because, well, you're not watching it, anything could happen to it. Writers with a great amount of natural talent for writing, the advantage is that they have their desks set up for them when they come to write already. However, they still need to put the work into actually writing, to building on the talent that they do have and getting better at it. It doesn't mean that they are naturally great at it and immediately as good as they'll ever be. Writers that don't perceive themselves to have the same amount of innate talent will need to set up their desk and make sure everything's in line before they do the writing, but the hard work I think is the same and it should be done by all parties, regardless of talent or perceived talent. Number seven, even if what you're working on doesn't go anywhere, it'll help you with the next thing you're doing. Make yourself available for something to happen, give it a shot. Definitely agree with this one, I think it's a really good point. Every word that you put down, you're one word closer to the kind of writer that you're dreaming of being. Everything that you put down, even if you then delete it, is still progress. Every second or minute that you put into writing, you are advancing and getting better. I've written quite a lot over the last 10 years, seven novels, some short stories, flash fiction, and some of that I'm not that proud of, but I wouldn't actually change it. Everything I wrote, I learned something from, and I realized what not to do, as well as what to do, and it was all valuable. All of that contributed to how I feel about my writing now, which is that overall, I'm quite happy with the stuff I put out. Without all of those failed stories and those novels with no plot, I wouldn't have that. I'd still be trying to figure out all the different parts of storytelling. So I definitely think just writing over and over again is the best way to progress. And don't feel that if you get to the end of a story and it's not what you thought, that it was a waste of time. You're constantly leveling up, earning experience points with everything that you put down on the page. Number eight, if it doesn't concern life and death, it's not interesting. Is it possible in any way for a story not to be about life? I don't think that's even a thing that can exist as far as I'm concerned. Every story echoes human life in some way way or another in some strange fashion. I think that's just unavoidable. Death, on the other hand, I don't know if that has to be part of every single story. This kind of links back to what I was saying before about subject matter carrying your story for you. You don't have to have blood and guts and shooting and violence in all of your stories in order to make them exciting or interesting for a reader. Characters don't have to die. You don't have to write a battle scene. There doesn't have to be a final face-off. All of that stuff is optional. There are other ways to make an exciting story or an interesting story or a story that matters. So I agree with 50% of this advice. I don't think you can write anything that isn't about life. However, I don't think it has to be about death in order to be interesting, necessarily. Number nine, the best things just sort of come out of the blue. It's a subconscious process. You don't really know what you're doing most of the time. Absolutely. That I feel like is really honest advice and that's a really honest way of talking about the creative process. Neil Gaiman's another person that talks about this really honestly. Who does know where stories come from? I definitely don't. I joke with my wife sometimes that there's a little man in my head that works on all this stuff in the background and then he sends that story idea up a, one of those suction pipes like you see in old buildings and it just arrives for me ready to write and it does feel like that a lot of the time. It feels like a subconscious process that's had a lot of work put into it. By the time it arrives in your conscious mind, the origin of that is a total mystery to me. I've got no idea. I wish I did know, as probably all writers do, because being able to pull from that or to receive those ideas at will would be a great advantage, but it just doesn't work that way. You have to engage in things that inspire you in order to prompt the whole system, I suppose. All I can really do is keep reading and watching things and listening to music and doing stuff generally that helps with my inspiration and hope that another idea comes out of the void. Allowing yourself to be in a position to receive an idea and be inspired, I think that's the only thing you can do while you're waiting, as frustrating as that is.
Today I want to talk about Anne Rice's tips for writers. Her most famous work is probably Interview with a Vampire, but she's written tons of other novels and some short fiction too. She also has some writing advice videos of her own, which I'll link in the description. Here's some of her tips for writers. Number one, write the book of your dreams. Write what you want to be known for. Later, she says, go where you really want to be with your writing and write that thing that you're really excited to write. I think most of the motivation that carries me through work, especially long work, has to come from being excited about that idea. It has to come from me trying to bring a story into the world that doesn't already exist that I want to read. So I definitely agree with what she says here. And if you're new to writing, don't underestimate just how far being excited about your story will carry you through writing it. It brings you enough energy to start writing it or to just plan it all the way through and that energy then kind of changes as you go along. It turns from I want to create this thing to I want to finish this thing but it still comes from that place of, I want this story to exist, so I'm gonna write it. If you get an instinct that this idea is really good and I'm excited about it and I think it's better than my other ideas, then you're most likely correct. So I definitely try and follow those ideas. Number two, you may write two or three chapters of a book and decide you hate it. Don't throw it away, save it. This is definitely a good idea. I've fallen foul of this just a couple of times myself where I've read through something and thought, there's absolutely no value to this and I've deleted it and never seen it again. And I haven't necessarily come back to something and thought, I really wish I still had that story, it was good after all. But the value of it might have been in something I said, a specific phrasing or the root of something or how I approach something that I later thought, I've done this before. How did I do it? It was in that story and then I've gone to find it and it doesn't exist anymore. So even if you do fall out of love with those first few chapters or those last few chapters, keep them because you never know what you might need to refer back to at a later date. Also, I think that rereading your own bad writing is arguably more useful than reading your good writing. Say you get into a slump, you're stuck with writer's block and you're feeling pretty demotivated and unhappy with your writing. If you then go back and read a story that you wrote three years ago that isn't quite up to the standard that you're writing at now, it can feel like a motivation. When you compare it to the stuff you're writing now and you see how far you've come from it, even if that's only a short way, your writing will more than likely be better. Probably a lot better if it's a matter of three years. That can propel you forward a bit. That can give you a slightly different perspective on your current writing that might just get you over that hump and get you writing again. For some reason, I tend to think of my writing as always having been at a consistent point. When in fact, when I read back things from years ago, it's totally different. The way I do things has changed, the overall quality has changed, and it does make you think, yeah, I've come quite a long way, so even if I'm not where I wanna be now, then at least it's proof of concept that in a few years, or not even that, I might get to where I really wanna be. That could be a useful exercise, actually. Read the most recent thing you wrote, and then go back and read the very first thing you ever wrote. The difference between them is gonna be huge, and if you delete all of your old bad writing because you hate it, you never get the chance to learn just how far you've come. Number three, create through writing the person that you wanna be. I think there's probably a couple of ways that you could look at this. I mean, first of all, I think it's an aspirational thing. It's about becoming the kind of author that you want to be. And for me, that means tapping into the real point of what I'm trying to write. For me, it's about consistently writing and trying to always be improving or working on something. And it's about trying to reach the pinnacle of what I can achieve as a writer. If you're the kind of writer that always has a strong message with what you write and you're trying to draw attention to something or trying to change something, then I think create the person you're trying to be will strongly link into that. It's like creating the world that you wanna see. The two things work in parallel together. And I think whether you write literary fiction or genre fiction, there's always gonna be a part of yourself in every story that you write. So as you work on improving your writing, you're, you could say, improving yourself at the same time. The second way I think you can look at this is in terms of character. In the same way that our stories are somewhat reflections of ourselves, characters can absolutely take the character traits of the author and dial them up or pull them back a little bit. I think you can't really write anything that's completely non-autobiographical. It's impossible to write something that is totally not you and has no piece of you in it whatsoever. So in some ways, the characters that you create are reflections on yourself. The reason that you give certain characters certain attributes will always reflect back on what you think about yourself or about other people. Even if you lace your villain with every kind of bad attribute in the book, 
that's because you don't want to see those attributes within yourself or within other people. I think a book or a story is always going to reflect some part of what the author thinks about themselves or the world. So trying to write that perfect character or trying to create a real person in your characters is a reflection on that and it's somewhat therapeutic really. Number four, the great thing about our profession is there are no rules. This is a tough one because sometimes to me it feels like there really are rules and then other times it feels like there isn't. It depends what stage you're at in your writing, whether you're newer or you're more experienced. Also, I think it could depend whether you're published or you're just writing for yourself. If you're writing for yourself, you can write absolutely whatever you want, but it's just not true that there are no rules for published authors. Some things just would never get published. That's just the way the world works. And to be honest, probably for the better. If I could be so bold as to tweak Anne Rice's statement just a little bit, I would say don't let rules get in the way of your story. I think that's a better for me way of looking at it. Don't avoid writing something because it means you'll have to break a rule and don't change the way you're writing something in order to stay within the lines. Most of the time as writers, I think our creative instinct or how we approach things as we're writing will bring us more than likely the most authentic results. I think when you avoid that instinct or when you actively change it, it changes the story in ways that you can't really comprehend. It doesn't feel like the story anymore. This happened to me a few years ago when I was writing a novel that I sent to an agent, she returned it and said, change this about it, which was the entire setting. Change this and then we'll be good to go. So I did, and it didn't feel like the same story anymore. It lost so much that I thought was special about it and it killed all the passion for the project for me and I ended up turning in a really poor book that obviously didn't end up getting published. I broke rules with what I'd written and that was part of what made the story special for me. So I would say if you're worried about the way that you're writing your book and if you're breaking rules yourself, as long as it feels right to you, keep going and at least finish the story. If you send it out to a bunch of people and they all say, this is a problem, then yeah, sure, maybe think about revising it or changing it or just tweaking it a small amount. But like we said in an earlier tip, if you do change that stuff, keep hold of it. Because if making those changes just kills all of your excitement, then you're going to want the original back because you know that's the way it's supposed to be. Rules can help keep your story under control, there's no doubt about it. But that point where your story needs to stray outside of them, don't worry about that. Keep going, go with your instinct, it'll probably work out for the best. Number five, don't ever think that you have to know a whole lot about publishing to break in. You really don't. I'm a little bit split on this one. Publishing seems to be something that people really struggle to agree on. Personally, traditional publishing probably isn't gonna work for me and I'm not really pursuing it anymore, but other writers are, and they're making that their aim with what they're writing and for good reason. I think what she means by this is that when people say you have to know someone to get into the industry or to get your foot into the door, then that's not necessarily true. And I'm sure it probably isn't because you do hear stories about first time authors sending a book, it's going through the slush pile, grabs an agent and then gets a publishing deal and all that great stuff that a lot of writers aspire towards and I've aspired towards in the past as well. That definitely happens. The bit about it that I can't make my mind up on is whether you need to know anything about publishing in order to break in because different literary agents especially always ask for different things. I've sent novel queries to quite a few literary agents and a lot of them say, give us two examples of books that have sold well that your story is like. So. In that way, you definitely do need to know about publication. And really, it suggests then that you need to target your story or create your story in a way that you can make it sure it's comparable to other stuff that's sold well. I never did that. I didn't feel I was accurate enough and it didn't feel authentic enough for me to do that. I didn't feel like I was writing my story, so I couldn't do it. That meant that quite a few replies I got from literary agents said, we like it, but we don't know if we can sell it. So that was what really put me off traditional publishing. It wasn't that my story wasn't good enough or how I'd written wasn't good enough. It was the fact that they didn't know if they could sell it or not because there was no proven market for it or there was no very comparable texts that I could compare it to. I just can't make my mind up on this point because I think if you do want traditional publishing, then it's a good idea to find those comparable texts and to package your book in a way that is marketable and that agents are gonna know exactly who to send it to. But at the same time, those shots in the dark that are really not comparable to anything and kind of original, they do happen. Quite often, in fact. Traditional publishing is probably just one of those things I'm never gonna figure out. Number six, never revise that book because you got a rejection from an editor with a bunch of negative advice. Any editor who rejects your book doesn't get it. 
She then says, revise instead for the editor who says they love it and suggests ways to make it even better. I love this advice. I have got a video about how to deal with writing feedback and in that, I'm pretty sure I said something sort of similar, no, not as clear and concise and to the point as, as what Anne Rice said. But I think the intention of the feedback is so important and she's absolutely right. If an editor says they don't like it and here's a bunch of negative things that you need to change, why would you listen to that? If they don't like any part of it, or they don't like it enough to say, we're interested in this, why would their opinion matter? It's obviously not the story for them, and changing all those things is only gonna make it somewhat of a story for them. How is that useful to anyone? I think instead listening to the person who loves it and suggests ways to make it better, as she says, is absolutely the right course of action. First of all, that's gonna be a way more productive relationship and it's gonna be less nerve wracking for all involved. There's nothing worse than sending a revised piece of work back to someone who you judge as an authority and having them come back and say, no, this is nothing like what I wanted. That's happened to me and it was demoralizing. It was in fact that same project I talked about earlier. I think if you can work with someone that understands what you're trying to do with your book and understands the heart of what you're trying to get at, that's always gonna be more productive for everyone. Even people like line editors or proofreaders or cover designers, if they are on board with what you're writing and they like the idea of it, surely, surely that has to translate into a, an end product that's got to be better. If an editor didn't like what you were writing at all, the subject matter or the story or how you wrote, then surely they're gonna find just tons upon tons of things to change or things to amend or things that they just don't like. And that's gonna cause you more work as a writer, but the output of it isn't necessarily gonna be a better book. It might then be further away from what people who would understand it would really wanna see and closer to something that the people who don't like it might be able to accept. And that's no use to anyone. I'd say if you're looking for feedback on your writing, then the most useful feedback might not come from the most qualified person or the person with the most you know, edits under their belt or whatever, it'll come from the person who understands your work the best. So I'd try to find that person. There will be one, there always is. Number seven, don't hesitate to write one sentence paragraphs and short paragraphs in general. Never, never bury a key revelation or surprise or important physical gesture by a character at the end of an existing paragraph. Move this to a new paragraph. This is really practical, actionable advice, and I like it a lot. Moving something very important onto a line of its own makes it stand out on the page, it makes it unmissable. Also, I'm quite a visual person when I read, so I'm far more likely to remember a, a short line on its own separate from the rest of the shape of the page than if it's just in a paragraph somewhere. This probably relates back to what she says about there being no rules with writing. And I think newer writers might be slightly more tentative when it comes to moving stuff into one line to just make a big deal of it. And they'd rather think, well, it should be in a paragraph like everything else. It, you know, it has to make sense. It has to conform to the standards of good English prose and all that stuff. But really, the important point is making it clear and making it stick out to a reader so that they don't miss it. That's more important than your presentation or whether you're absolutely right according to this or that writing guide. Readers don't really care about that. As well as just making sure it isn't missed by a reader, Giving something a line of its own just gives it more emphasis. It makes it a stronger statement and it gives a reader a clue that it's something important. If you're hinting at something that you're gonna reveal later on in the book, then hiding that in a big paragraph might seem like the way to go because it'll be less likely to be spotted by people and they'll be surprised by it. But if they don't remember the clue was there, you won't get credit for it at the end. So if you make it clearer and put it down there, they'll remember reading the clue and they'll remember that they missed it because if you do your twist well enough, or if you hide that secret well enough, then it should be in plain sight the entire time and your reader still won't see it. I find that's really satisfying as a reader. I love that feeling of, how did I miss this? They did a really good job of hiding that in plain sight. I don't come across too many practical writing tips that I really agree with so strongly, but this one's really useful and I'm gonna make a note of it for my own writing. Number eight, if the plot takes a highly improbable turn, acknowledge that through having the characters acknowledge it. That's an interesting point, and I suppose it depends on what you view as improbable. I think maybe the dangerous side of this advice is writers hearing that and thinking, okay, so I can make absolutely anything I want happen then as long as the characters acknowledge it and go, that was weird. And I don't think it really works that way. 
I think there has to be some hint beforehand of an improbable thing happening. I think it's likely to make readers feel a bit cheated if a story takes a sudden turn in a completely unforeseen direction and all you've got as an explanation is a character going, how very strange. I don't think that's going to cut it. I think a reader would still feel a little bit thrown off by that. My opinion on this is that a combination of two different approaches will work in this kind of scenario. I would say bury at least some clues throughout the story, especially in the, in the chapters leading up to it or the passages leading up to it. Definitely get some idea that something is about to happen. And then once you've done that, once that improbable thing has happened, yes, have the characters acknowledge it as well. Bookend it with some hints on one side and some character acknowledgement on another side. That will make the whole thing feel a little smoother. It'll smooth over the hump a little bit and make it seem a little bit more palatable to your reader so it won't completely come out of left field. I think without the hints beforehand, an improbable thing might seem too improbable. And without the character acknowledgement, it'll seem unexplained and weird. And of course, there's always twists that the audience doesn't see coming. The important thing is that those twists and those improbable events make sense. And that's done by hinting beforehand and character acknowledgements as well. That's my opinion anyway. Number nine, never get trapped into thinking that if you have a character open a door, he necessarily has to close it later on. You're creating a visual impression of a scene and you don't need to spotlight every gesture. This is really useful practical advice as well. The first place my mind went when she started talking about opening and closing doors was the plot, was twists and turns and you know threads that are left open. I don't think she's talking about plot. I think she's talking about physical doors. She's trying to say avoid the type of writing that's, I went up the stairs, I opened the door, I closed the door, I sat down at the desk, that kind of thing. We don't need to know all of those details. I think this is a trap that newer writers tend to fall into as opposed to more experienced writers. Newer writers don't necessarily trust themselves to communicate what's happening to their reader, or they detail bits of everyday life that try to make the story feel relatable, but really all it does is make the story feel boring and kind of tedious to read. You can absolutely trust your reader to fill in the blanks with their imagination, especially when it comes to movements within a room and stuff like that. Readers get it, they understand. It's not your job to absolutely paint in any blank space in your story. As a writer that used to fall into this trap a lot, I've learned to trust myself more. I don't need to fill in all of the gaps. Readers are smart enough to know what's going on and to fill those gaps in for themselves. It's not part of your job as a writer to do that. Another great practical bit of writing advice. Today I'm looking at writing advice from Amanda Gorman, who was America's first youth poet laureate and famously recited her poem, The Hill We Climb, at Joe Biden's inauguration. Normally I just cover fiction authors, but I found Amanda's thoughts on writing really valuable and pretty much universal to the pursuit of writing in general. So here's some of her tips for writers. Number one, you have to be okay with sitting down and recognizing you're not trying to write something great in this moment. You're trying to write and the greatness will come in itself from that. This is one of those things that sometimes gets really hard to remember when you're writing. I, for one, will always sit down and I think, I'm gonna write the best thing I've ever written. Every time I sit down, that's my aim. And really, that's kind of unhealthy when you think about it. Nobody can perform at that level so consistently. I just don't think it's possible from a creative perspective. But setting yourself the task of just beginning to write, just starting, just engaging with it, I think is way more realistic and somewhat more healthy. By always aiming to write something great, you're setting the bar really high for yourself and the chances of failure are subsequently much higher as well. That could easily lead to frustration, I think, and it's not much further down the line that you reach demotivation. It's really hard not to assess the value of your writing as you're writing it. It's really hard not to think about whether it's what you want it to be or whether it's up to the standard that you really want. The likelihood is you're probably comparing that writing to other writing that you love, other stories or other books, or even things that you've finished yourself. But the difference is those things are finished. They've gone through multiple drafts, they've been looked at by probably a whole host of people, and that's why they're so good. The first drafts of those stories and books probably weren't great immediately either. One of the biggest blocks for me when I'm writing is how much I think about efficiency. Is this the right story for me to be writing right now? Because it's not coming out 100% perfect. Maybe if I move to a different story, that one will be perfect. Or if I approach this differently, it'd be perfect. I spend a lot of time assessing my own writing as I go along, when really that time would be much better spent finishing stories that I can then edit and make much better. So I definitely agree with this tip. Just sit down and write. 
the rest will follow. Number two, read everything three times. For pleasure, to learn from the writer's style, and then to think about how you could write it better. This is a good practical tip to improve your craft, I think. And while you can't read everything that you read three times, because there just aren't enough hours in the day, I think if it's something that you particularly love or something that you particularly hate, this could be really useful. How many times have you reread your favorite book and found things that you'd missed the first time or the second time? It happens quite a lot. There's always stuff to be learned from something, even if you've read it before. So taking that first read just to enjoy the story, absolutely. And then after that, you can start looking at it with a more critical eye. I like to do this with some of my favorite books, which in some ways led to this series of famous authors writing advice, because I look at how people do things and what I can learn from them. And I take lines from the books that I love and figure out what's so great about them. It may sound a little bit like stealing, but it's not really. By the time you've taken that skill or that technique and applied it to your own story using your own phrasing and your own natural wording, it becomes something totally different, but it's still a great advantage to your story, I find. And that third reason to read things through, to think about how you could write it better, I think that taps into a central problem with most writers, that juxtaposition between your confidence in your story and your self-doubt in your own ability. It might feel slightly arrogant to think you could take your favourite book down off the shelf, pluck a line from it and think, I could write that better. Thing is though, it's not always about better. That exercise of evaluation really just helps you understand what you think is important as a writer and what you value and how you approach things. The evaluation isn't really on that other author, it's on you and how you approach story and how you put into practice all these skills and techniques that you've learned. Unless, of course, it's a book that you think is really terrible, in which case you can absolutely go through it and figure out what things you would do better with a little bit more confidence, but it still takes quite a lot of self-belief to do that because once you see something's been published, you assume it's of a certain quality, that that might not always be the case. So this one, two, three step, read for pleasure, learn from the writer's technique and figure out what you would have done differently, yeah, I think it's really useful. I'd say pick a favourite story or a favourite chapter and sit down and try it if you ever get stuck with your writing because you'll definitely learn something one way or the other. Number three, I do try not to force edits. Instead, I focus on what is the feeling that I want the reader or ear to receive from this poem, the gift. This aligns really well with my approach to writing, I think. It's all about what is important about the story, and that is your message or your meaning that you want to communicate to whoever's reading or listening to it. It's really tempting, especially when you're editing a first draft, to get down to the nitty gritty and think about exactly how you can rephrase something for maximum efficiency or to make it sound nicer or make it sound more lyrical. But the thing is, that stuff is less important than communicating that message to whoever's reading it. If you lose that message or that that meaning or it becomes muddy or blurry because you've over edited then really the nice editing on the nice phrasing it really doesn't have as much value when I first started writing I found this idea really difficult to get to grips with just stating things simply and concisely in plain English really didn't feel like writing to me everything I'd learned in school was about beautiful phrasing or lyrical writing or how the author had achieved this particular effect by the language that they'd used and the onomatopoeia and the assonance and all that stuff but the thing is although that's important I just don't think it's as important as getting a message across to a reader because not many readers are gonna read a story and then go I really love the assonance in that story they're gonna say I really loved how that story made me feel so Getting that feeling across should always be priority number one as far as I'm concerned and clearly as far as Amanda Gorman's concerned as well. Readers are interested in story, not the craft of writing. There's definitely stories that are writers writing where other writers will appreciate it more because of some of the things you've done or some of the things you've achieved or the way you've approached things, but readers are unlikely to pick up on that. What they will recognise is how that story makes them feel. Of course, everything that you put into writing goes to craft that feeling, but as long as you keep it in your mind, in the forefront of your mind when you're writing, I think that it translates to the reader one way or the other, even if they don't know exactly how you're making them feel this way or that way, I think it still comes across. Whatever genre or subject matter or form that you're writing in, I think it's always a good idea to prioritise the feeling that you're giving to your readers, so I strongly agree with that tip. Number four, I usually try to write for at least 15 minutes a day, or about 300 words a day. I'm not big on writing targets myself and I don't write every day, it just doesn't fit into my writing routine I suppose, but I think 300 words or 15 minutes is a really good target to aim for. The reason why I say that is because I think 300 words or 15 minutes is enough time or enough words to figure out whether it's going to work for you that particular day or not. 
For me, there's nothing worse than trying to push through and write something when I'm really just not getting anything out of it. That's really hard and I find it demotivating. It makes the next time I come to write feel even more difficult than the current time. I don't know too much about poetry and I probably should, but there's probably a big difference between 300 words of poetry and 300 words of novel writing. But 15 minutes of writing is 15 minutes of writing whatever it is that you're doing. And I think it's long enough where you can settle in and soon realize you've gone way past the 15 minute mark. And it's also only 15 minutes of agony if you're really unable to produce anything at all. It's not a huge chunk of your day. You can still go and do something else, read or study writing or figure something else out that might help you next time you sit down. I've had writing targets before, a thousand words a day, 2000 words a day. And while I've hit them, it hasn't really made me feel all that good. And the writing I produced also wasn't really all that good. The only value that really brought me was I was able to think I'm 1% further through my novel and that really wasn't much motivation for me. I would much rather spend 15 minutes or 300 words writing something that I really love than two hours a day or 2000 words of just hard graft getting it done for the sake of getting it done. All writers are different, of course, this is just my method to writing for whatever that's worth. But I think aiming for 15 minutes of writing a day might work for all kinds of writers. On the one hand, if you haven't got that much time or you can't concentrate for a long time, then 15 minutes is enough to get something down and to make some progress and to write a few lines that you really like. On the other hand, if 15 minutes then turns into a mammoth stint of writing where you spend hours and hours getting hundreds of, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of words down, then great. That 15 minutes was just the beginning of that. Either way, seems like a good aim to me. So I agree with this point as well. Number five, many young writers think that in order to be a writer, you have to have your work published in X, Y, and Z locations. That's not what it means to be a writer. It's a continuous journey that occurs before and after publication. The definition of what exactly a writer is is something that I find really interesting and there's a lot of different points of view on it. The one that stands out the most to me and that I identify with the most is that there's no such thing as an aspiring writer. To me, if you're writing stuff, whether that's for yourself or you're aiming to get published, whatever the case, that to me makes you a writer. How good you are at it, how long you've been doing it, how much you put into it, I don't think really matters. I don't think there are qualifiers that mean you're a writer or you're not. I've seen arguments that say you can't call yourself an author until you're traditionally published, but who really cares? As far as I'm concerned, call yourself whatever you want as long as you're sitting down and doing some writing and trying to create stories that mean something to you and that you hope might mean something to somebody else. The way I look at it, it seems really unfair that a celebrity who has a ghost written book and doesn't really write a word of it gets called an author, whereas someone who sits at their desk and writes story after story or novel after novel, even though they're not published, they don't get to call themselves an author or they don't get to call themselves a writer. That doesn't make sense to me. In my opinion, I think it's intention that makes all the difference. If you wanna create stories and you wanna bring them to life and you wanna work at your craft and have that continuous journey as she talks about, then to me, that absolutely makes you a writer. There is no aspiring in that because you're doing it. Sitting down and figuring out a story, getting all the moving parts working, getting everything moving in the right direction, is the same whether you're published or you're not published. So what difference does it make? It's not publishers or the publishing industry or other people on the internet that tell you if you're a writer or not. It's you. You get to decide that and you get to put it into practice with all the hard work that you put into your stories or your novel or whatever it is that you're writing. If you are writing but you don't feel like a legitimate writer and you don't feel like a real writer, I'd really spend some time trying to figure out why that is if you can. You absolutely are a writer and you have the right to call yourself that. Whether you keep your writing completely a secret or you tell people about it, that also doesn't matter. You get to decide whether you're a writer. That's something that happens within yourself and nowhere else. So as you can tell, I quite strongly agree with that point. Number six, rarely does a good idea come right when you want it to. Instead, you have to wait lovingly, preparing a place for inspiration to strike in your life. So when it does, it can thrive. You can tell from this tip how much Amanda Gorman's thought about her own writing process and her own creativity, because this links so well into her 15 minutes a day or 300 words a day tip. She talks about waiting here and creating a place for inspiration to strike, and that 15 minutes or those 300 words every day is exactly the space. I've heard a lot of writers and I've seen a lot of writers tips that say you can't wait for the muse, you have to engage yourself with writing and get going in order to really make it a habit and make it consistent and keep 
outputting valuable words. And I really do believe in that, even if I can't necessarily put it into practice myself. I can see that from both sides because sometimes I do feel inspired to write a story and then I'll write one and I'll really enjoy what I'm doing and I like the end product. But other times I don't feel that inspiration and I sit down and I do still end up writing something that I really like. I've already proved myself wrong in a couple of videos about what creates better writing, inspiration or hard work and perspiration. I'll link those videos up in the top there. I still think 15 minutes is enough to catch that inspiration and get something down, even if you don't have hours and hours to devote to writing every day. It doesn't mean you have to give up on this, this pursuit or this hobby. It just means scale it back a little bit, but make sure you're still just keeping your hand in and getting something done consistently. Even if you don't really write much or you don't really get anything down that you really love, the point is doing it, consistently achieving something by your writing. It doesn't matter what the quality is, just matters that you're putting in the hours to try to do it, to try to improve and to just keep it going. I think if you can do that, then the good ideas, as she says, will eventually come. There might be some bad ones here and there as well, there certainly is for me, but you learn something from everything you write. Today I want to talk about writing advice from Mark Haddon. His most famous work is probably his novel, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It won loads of awards and it was adapted to a stage show. I've read it and I enjoyed it. But my favourite piece of work from him is his short story collection, The Pier Falls, which I've talked about a lot on this channel recently. So links to those in the description. Some of this writing advice is from interviews and some of it's directly from his own website, but here's Mark Haddon's tips for writers. Number one, when I sit down to write, I know that most of what I produce will end up being discarded. And to write in spite of that knowledge takes more confidence than I possess on a regular daily basis. Not necessarily a tip, but nevertheless something I think is important to talk about. I've been writing for quite a few years now and I remember when I first started that I considered myself as different from published authors. I thought they did things in different ways than I did. They'd learned secrets that I hadn't yet. I figured they came up with ideas and sat down with total confidence and just wrote their books and the end product of that first draft was pretty close to what ends up getting published. And I thought also that they probably never really worried about confidence. They never really questioned their own ability as a writer because they were published. They knew they could do it. But that isn't the case. The more of these videos about author writing advice I've done, the more I've come to realise that every author has the same kind of worries. And there might be different degrees of worrying between one author and another, but still the same troubles come to all of us sometime or another. So if you identify with what he said about vast amounts of your work being discarded, or maybe you just don't love a huge amount of something that you've written and you end up trashing it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you're a bad writer. It doesn't necessarily mean that that was bad writing. I'm somewhere in between, personally. I've thrown away entire novels and I've thrown away half drafts of novels. I've deleted them permanently, never to see the light of day again, because I just assumed they were so bad. And to some extent, they probably were. But I've also written really accurately and kept first drafts of things that haven't really changed much after I've worked on them. I can't speak for every writer, obviously I can only speak for myself, but I tend to find that how much of a project I throw away or keep just depends on the project. It's not really a thing that's inherent in me and the way I write, it just tends to be based on the story that I'm writing. But my advice, if I was to add on to that, would be that it's all about where you end up, not how you get there. It doesn't matter if you have to throw away large amounts of your writing in order to get to the stuff that you really love. In the end, who's going to know and who's going to care? Nobody. They just want to read the end product. And if that end product is good, no one really cares how you got there. The other interesting thing you can take from that point is that obviously Mark Haddon's confidence varies on a daily basis, as well as ours might. When I was still mainly aiming to be a traditionally published writer, there were a lot of things that were aspirations to me that I thought would drop into place as soon as I was published. And I thought confidence would be one of those things, but clearly it isn't. I think the true route to confidence in writing, if there is one, rather than just accolades and being traditionally published, is just trying different things, trying to get familiar with as many different aspects of your craft as you can learning things, new skills and new techniques so that you feel like you're better able to handle the story that comes to you. The way I look at my own confidence when it comes to writing is that I don't really have a lot of control over it and I probably never will. Some days I'm going to feel good about it, some days I'm not, but whatever the case, as long as I keep writing, that's all you can really do and that's the best way to keep progressing and getting better as a writer. 
Number two, it's harder to procrastinate when other people are watching. I'm not really a coffee shop writer, and that's sort of what he's talking about here if you read the interview, but I think you can look at this in a different way. It doesn't necessarily have to be about people being around you and witnessing you doing your writing or whatever. I think I would look at this more in terms of community. I know some writers work really well with accountability partners, other writers that are also working on projects so you can share your progress and check in and make sure you keep adding to your story. But for me, that's not really how it works. I do tend to work fairly well on my own and I generally am okay with motivating myself most of the time. However, when I'm totally without community with writing, that's when I get a bit lost. I won't go on and on about my years of never speaking to other writers because that's something I've talked about plenty on this channel already. But what I found when I was like that is that I never really developed that much. I didn't have anything to share with anybody. I didn't read anybody else's writing in progress. I was only reading fantastic published works and comparing myself against that. So what ended up happening for me was procrastination by stagnation in a way. I was still writing novel after novel, thinking I was progressing, but I wasn't testing myself. I wasn't taking feedback from anybody. I wasn't learning new things. I wasn't putting myself out there. I was just sitting in the comfortable bubble that I was in. And if that isn't procrastination, I'm not really sure what is. Now that I have this channel, which is a place for me to share my own writing and on my website as well, link in the description, there's always a place for me to put something that I write or there was always an end goal for projects that I can put together and then publish even just myself as well as sending out to journals and other places. But it's that outside, not pressure, but encouragement or opportunity really that keeps me going a lot of the time and helps me avoid procrastination. So definitely agree with that. Number three, writing is like surgery or flying a plane. You need to be firing on all cylinders or you need to be doing something else. I wouldn't necessarily compare writing to flying a plane or performing surgery. Something tells me there's probably a little more at stake in those particular professions. But still, I understand what he means by this. And it's something that I do agree with. I've done some experiments on this particular topic on my channel already, and I'll link those videos down in the description. But Essentially what came out of them was the realisation that whether I was firing on all cylinders or just not really feeling it that, that day, the end product of the writing, at least from a reader's perspective, didn't feel all that different. So maybe there's grounds to disagree with this tip. However, how I feel when I am firing on all cylinders or really feeling in the mood for writing is a lot different. I feel like I have so much more fun when I feel into it and my mind's in the right place compared to when I sit down and think I really need to write something so I, I better get on with it. That I don't find anywhere near as much fun. You could argue that the end product is more important than how I feel about it as I'm doing it, but really, I'm not aiming to be traditionally published. I'm writing for myself and for my channel and for my website, so I think fun is really the most important part of it for me. So unless I can figure out how to have fun even when I'm not feeling all that great about what I'm writing, I'd have to say I definitely do agree with this point. I need to be firing on all cylinders, that's just how I write, but you may be very much different and that's fine. Number four, I don't think I would keep writing without being driven by a constant nagging voice at the back of my head saying over and over, that wasn't good enough, write more, write better, time is running out. That is pretty much my day-to-day -day inner monologue when it comes to writing. I'm always in a position of looking for something that I can do better or find out that I didn't know before. It might be obvious from watching my videos and I kind of hope it is, but constant improvement is something that definitely drives me. And I think it's something good to aim for because while having fun with writing, as I just talked about, is definitely a good goal and something that I think should be at the forefront of the reason why you do it. I think constant improvement gives you that motivation and that little more reason to keep going sometimes. The important thing that I try to remember with this though is that I measure my progress internally and not externally. I'm not thinking I need to be better so I can win more prizes. I need to be better so I can get published. I need to be better so everyone will know that I'm a great writer. None of that comes into it for me at all. I want to be better so that I can prove to myself that I've learned something or that I've mastered something and that's what drives me more than outside validation. I think when you quietly work hard and try to improve and focus on your weaknesses and also play to your strengths, I think that comes out through your writing. I think focusing on what makes everybody else better than you isn't always that healthy an idea. 
and it's not always that motivational or that encouraging when you're trying to get better at something. It's always worth looking at what you can do better and there always is something you can do better. It doesn't matter who you are. However, it's worth remembering too what you're good at and what you already do well and enjoying that a little bit. The way I look at it is that the voice in the back of my head that's pushing me forward day after day, trying to make me better and trying to help me learn things is doing just that. It's trying to help me. It's trying to carry me forward. It's not trying to push me forward or trying to drive me forward. I'm getting a little bit meta, but the voice is on my side and it's helping me achieve what I want to achieve. And that's why I think it's useful. Number five, it's not about you. Readers don't want an insight into your mind, they want an insight into their own. A book that will put them in touch with a part of themselves they didn't even know existed. That's a really good point, I think, and it's something that's really easy to miss when you're writing at all levels. There's a very subtle difference between putting your heart into something and making something entirely about you. I think especially if you know a lot about your subject matter or you're drawing on real life experience for your story, it's easy to fall into that trap of making it really about your experience rather than the general experience and how it could apply to everybody else. It sounds harsh when I put it like this. I'm sure the inside of your brain is a really interesting place and all of your ideas are really interesting. However, the person that they are most interesting in the world to, I guarantee, is you. The best way to make use of those ideas is to find out how you can apply them to everyone else, how you can make them universal and you can make them understandable by everybody else around you. If your work is, as he says, an insight into your mind, then it's a very narrow cross-section of life and that some people will be able to identify with. However, if you widen that cross-section, you'll find more people are able to identify with it. More people will find reasons to fall in love with your stories. And whether you want commercial success or recognition or anything, I think appealing to more people and allowing more people to feel something some kind of emotional connection or some kind of connection of experience to your writing is something we should all aim for and probably something we all want. It's really hard to find those moments if you write solely from your perspective in that very narrow cross section, I find. Number six, read your work out loud, preferably to other people. Things that work or don't work are sometimes invisible on paper, but obvious when heard. This is a tip that I've heard very often and very rarely put into practice myself. However, if you've seen any of my recent videos, you'll know that I'm reading a 100 word story in pretty much every one of them. And I have found that when I've read these stories, I definitely notice things that I didn't notice when I was writing it. Even though they're only 100 words long, I still spot things that I wanna change. I don't know if it's because your mind is only hearing what you want to hear when you read things silently, or your brain is just picking up what you already think that you put down, but when you read it out loud, it does make some kind of difference. and. I find it's useful to me as a bit of perspective because it's challenging to write um, even a 100 word story every week or every couple of weeks and to post that knowing that a few hundred people at least are gonna watch that and read that story or hear that story along with me. So reading it out loud for me, it's sort of a first audit of the story really. It makes me focus on where the points of emphasis are in each sentence or whether things sound right as they come out, whether there's too much of the same sound in a sentence or not enough of when it becomes a monotone, that kind of thing. Just like that sentence did not come out right at all. The one thing that sticks out to me about this advice is how are you supposed to listen to an entire novel out loud? How are you supposed to read an entire novel out loud? I suppose you could do if you live alone or you live with people that are patient enough to hear you mumble into yourself in another room for a or the same room for hours on end, but I would find that a challenge, I think. I write mainly flash fiction and short stories, so it's feasible that I could read everything that I write out loud. I suppose you'd have to cut it into chapter by chapter and just do bits at a time. That's the obvious way to do it, but it still seems like quite a big undertaking. However, if it works, and if it does really help you spot things that you can't see otherwise, then I definitely think there's you know, reason to do it. For me, it almost feels like it's a different version of myself doing the reading than did the writing. And I suppose if you're not gonna send your work to another person, this is as close as you're gonna get to another mind entirely reading your story and giving you feedback on it. So if you've got the time and the patience and a drink of water, maybe try it, it could be well worth it. Number seven, 
All half-decent writers have a nagging voice in their head telling them which bits work and which don't. Maybe you can't hear it yet, maybe you don't want to hear it. Cultivate this voice and learn to trust it. This is a really difficult thing when you're new to writing, because a lot of the time, everything you're doing feels like it's not right. It's hard to figure out whether you're just being overly critical or whether you just don't have enough information to figure out whether you're doing a good job or not. That's really hard. The only answer, the only way to tune into that voice properly is to keep writing more and more and also I think to keep reading and not necessarily just those fantastic perfect published pieces of work alliteration that you know are available for you to compare yourself to and to aspire to be like but also to read other people's works in progress other writers of a similar level to you or just a level above or a level below you know subjectively however you want to look at that it's worth looking at how other people do things as well because that will develop that voice. You'll apply that voice to other people's writing and that just builds its volume in your own mind and you'll be able to figure out how to do it to your own writing as well. When you do figure out how to hear that voice and how to actually listen out for it, it's endlessly useful. And for me, usually it's a good portion of time after I've written the first draft or the second draft, when I'm editing something, that's when I hear that voice the clearest. But it's not a permanent fixture. Sometimes I can read something back and that voice is clear as day telling me to change something about the story. Other times it's not there at all. And it's not about the actual story because I can come back to it at a different time and the voice is there. It's just one of those things, like everything with writing, that is inconsistent, difficult to do regularly and just hard to master. For me, I find that there's imposter versions of this voice in my head as well. And that imposter version will try to make me change things based on something other than the good of the story. On days when I'm not feeling particularly motivated about my writing or I feel really tired, I can fall for that impersonation and I can change something or I can look at my writing in general in a whole other light and I lose the truth of that actual real guiding voice. It's not so much about recognizing it every time you see it, it's about generally understanding what that voice really wants from you and what that voice is really guiding you towards on over a longer period. I feel like I'm just waffling at this point but anyway it gets easier the more you write but it's inconsistent as always. That's just my take on it as another writer that's just learning my craft. Today I want to talk about Blake Crouch's writing advice. I'm a big fan of his work, he writes these fast paced sci-fi thrillers and they're the kind of books that you just can't put down, I'll link some of them in the description down below. I found a load of useful writing advice from him in a Goodreads Q&A he did a while back, so here's some of Blake Crouch's tips for writers. Number one, I come up with a loose outline that goes at least through the midpoint and when I feel good about it, I start writing. The outline can and should change as I write and discover new things about the story. This is an interesting point, I think, because he's a great example of a very successful writer that neither falls completely into the planning or the pantsing side of writing. It's an age-old argument or an age-old question with writing. What produces better results if you plan out everything and then write according to the outline or if you just follow wherever you think the story needs to go and make it up as you go along. However, it's not really as simple as that. It isn't just a choice between the one approach or the other. It's a spectrum and every writer is going to be at a different point on that spectrum. Blake Crouch seems like a good example of someone that's halfway between really. He has to have an outline to get the story going but after that he's fine. That's similar to what I do when I write long projects like a novel. I'll plan as much of it as I can and then after that I just see where it goes and see where it takes me. What surprised me about this, having read some of his books, is that he's not an out and out planner. The plots of his stories are really complicated, really complex and intricate, and I expected him to say that that's all figured out in the outline, but to hear him say it's somewhere between I think is really refreshing. It's easy for new writers and writers who are working on their crafts to feel alienated and excluded when they don't fit into one of these particular camps and they feel like they're stranded somewhere in between, but really we're all at a different point along that spectrum. and. Whatever works for you is valid. In this case, it's a little bit of both and I think it's really good to highlight that. Number two, even with the first drafts of my books, I find my characters can come across as thin. It's only in subsequent drafts and drilling down into why I'm writing these particular characters do they start to come fully alive. 
This is another refreshing insight into the troubles that hit all writers, even successful published ones. Character, I think, is a big challenge for every writer because essentially we're trying to write people and people are complicated and they don't make much sense and they're not logical. So it can be really difficult to make them feel alive and feel like genuine, authentic people. What I like about this approach is that he's highlighting that you don't have to have all the answers on the first draft. You don't have to know everything inside and out and you don't have to know your entire character back to front. You can find their character as you go along. You can start with a couple of key facts about them and as the story progresses you can get to know them better and then you can reinforce that in your editing. I think that's a really good point. The takeaway from this I think is that it's all right if it takes you a while to get to know your characters because you can always go back in and fill in detail if you need to. I really like this piece of advice. Number three, no matter how much you have doubts or insecurities, you can't let it actually affect the work. Sounds cheesy, but at heart you have to believe in the stories you have to tell. I agree with this one for sure. I talk about this fairly often on my channel as well. It's all about the back and forth of confidence and insecurity that comes to all writers. Honestly, I don't think there's too much you can do to avoid that back and forth, but as long as you have that belief in your story, like he says, and maybe it does sound cheesy, but to me it doesn't, but I think as long as you have that throughout and you remember what's good about your story and what the message is or the meaning is or just what you really love about it, I think you'll keep yourself on an even keel. Whatever the case, whether you're writing a flash fiction or a novel, I think you've got to believe that you're writing the story for the right reason and that you're making the point that you really want to make and getting at the thing that caused you to want to write it in the first place. I think that's detectable by a reader as well. They can feel that purpose and that direction in what you're writing. We've all read stories that don't necessarily go anywhere or books that don't seem to have any particular purpose with them and I personally enjoy those a lot less than when I can feel what the author is driving at when I'm reading. So I definitely agree with this point and I think it's something that's well worth bearing in mind when you're writing. Number four, I rarely know how a book is gonna end until I'm about 100 pages out from finishing. I find this one really interesting. I don't work this way. I tend to always have an ending in mind when I'm writing anything. I tend to, that tends to be the bit that I pick out first and then I write towards that. So even though he says he plans half the story, it's the first half that he plans and then the rest of it he finds along the way, including the ending. And I find that really interesting. It's not something I think I could necessarily do because I need that direction. But again, it's clearly demonstrating that everyone has different approaches to writing. I don't think I've heard too many people say that they could write two thirds of a book, more or less, without knowing how it's gonna end. That's a really interesting approach, I think. And maybe you're a person that doesn't write off an outline and finds the story, including the ending, as you go along. In that case, it's really, I think, encouraging to hear that other people can do it too, especially with such complex stories as I talked about before. Overall, I think it just sounds like a really fun way to write a book because you can surprise yourself towards the end as well as you might surprise the readers. And that probably would make your book feel less predictable for a reader. It feels like that to me anyway. Perhaps there'd be fewer clues or giveaways about how things are finally gonna wind up if the author didn't know for the first two thirds of the book. Again, I probably couldn't work that way, but if you could, then I think there's advantages to doing it. Number five, a lot of my writing method changes from book to book, whatever it takes. This is my favorite thing that he said in this whole Q&A because it makes the most sense to me. I find that nothing is set in stone with the way I write and approach stories. Every single one is different. Every book I've written, I wrote in a different way. One thing I'm perhaps guilty of on this channel is talking a little bit too much about finding what works for you and then writing towards that. Because like he says, sometimes this stuff just changes. It depends on the story or it depends on how you're feeling at that particular point. What worked for you previously might not work again. And that's why I talk about learning as many skills and dipping your toe into as many different parts and aspects of writing as you possibly can because you never know what's gonna work for you in your next story. It's worth learning all this stuff just in the off chance that your approach just shifts a little bit and you find you need different tools to tell your story. It's also just a really encouraging thing to hear from another writer that they don't know exactly how they do things either and things don't stay the same. Number six, a truly surprising but right ending is one of the hardest things to do. The comparison to air travel is apt. Taking off is easy. Landing the plane, especially in challenging conditions, is very, very hard. This is an interesting point as well. Like I said before, the ending is, tends to be the thing that I think of first when I'm writing the story, and then the rest of the story works towards that. 
So I don't necessarily have this same struggle that he has when he reaches two thirds point and then needs to figure out how to end. I can definitely understand how that would be difficult. I think maybe the issue with that is that your story has taken a certain shape over those two thirds or the, over the run up to the ending that means it's sort of limited in the directions that you can go with it. Introducing something out of the blue that the reader is never going to see coming, I think it has the chance to feel pretty cheap to a reader. They might feel a little bit cheated. But if you haven't written the book with clues and all sorts of things that lead to a particular ending throughout it, then it can be difficult to figure out where to go. That's why I think having the ending in mind when you're writing it can inform the choices that you make as you go along and that makes the whole thing seem a little bit more easy to manage. But I definitely think it's difficult to please everyone with an ending. Some people don't like happy endings, some people only like happy endings, some people hate twists at the end and it makes them feel like they're cheated out of the ending. Some people hate open endings, but I really enjoy open endings again. Endings are absolutely one of the hardest parts of writing any story, but I tend to find when the right ending comes to you, you know it by feel. It tends to make a lot of sense and it tends to feel exciting. You just know it when you see it. But if that doesn't happen, there's nothing wrong with trying out multiple endings, even if you're only just planning it and you don't write them all through. Planning a number of them and then tracing the story and seeing which ending makes the most sense, I think seems like a decent approach and it might help you figure out gaps or downfalls to a particular ending that will force you towards another one. But he's definitely right, ending a book and landing that plane in exactly the right way is really, really hard. Today I want to talk about Ray Bradbury's writing advice. His work spanned many genres and he won numerous awards and I was able to find quite a few pearls of wisdom from interviews with him. So here's a few of Ray Bradbury's tips for writers. Number one, you must never think at the typewriter, you must feel. Your intellect is always buried in that feeling anyway. Obviously there's always going to be some thinking when you're sitting down and writing a story, but I think essentially I'm going to take this as meaning don't overthink. And I think that is really useful advice. I tend to write by feel myself. I'm not a big outliner or a big planner. I tend to just see what feels right and follow that. Before I discovered that about myself and that that was the approach that worked for me when it came to writing, I spent a lot of time overthinking. I'd think about whether I was hitting the structure I needed to hit or whether I, in, this was in the right place or this needed to happen here or elsewhere or whether it was exciting enough, was it tense enough? All of these considerations were going on in my mind and I found it almost impossible to just get anything written like that. And of course, not everybody's like me. Some people do write by thinking and planning and being really accurate and detailed. And I think, you know, both approaches result in some brilliant stories. There is no correct approach, as I've said many times on this channel, but the advice of not overthinking, I think can be useful whatever approach you take to writing. There's always gonna be little doubts in everything that you write. Every project is gonna have small imperfections and things that you wish you could change or you don't know how to change or did you really come at that the right way and it's easy to spend a lot of time rereading and thinking and wondering where to go next and trying to plan five steps ahead of yourself when you haven't quite figured out the step that you're on. It's a minefield. All of that stuff that relies on thinking can really slow you down if you can't figure it out. So in that way, I think not overthinking is really good advice, but you know, you can't underthink either if you write by feel like I do. It's a balance of two things, as is most stuff when it comes to writing, but I write by feel, so I would say that some people might not write by feel whatsoever. And in that case, this, this advice might not make any sense at all, but just to me. Number two, if you get the big truth, the small truths will accumulate around it. I like this one a lot. And as I tend to do a lot with these writing advice from famous authors, I found two meanings for this tip. The first one is really the, the one I reached first, the big truth and the small truth. It's about the meaning of what you're writing, the message or what you want to achieve by writing your story. The second meaning I think can be found in the actual writing, the actual step-by-step, -step, sentence by sentence writing. The first interpretation feels to me like it was probably the one that Ray Bradbury meant when he said this, but I think he's talking about how as writers, we have to handle big issues or meanings or messages 
one piece at a time. When you do have a big message that you want to put into your writing, it's really hard to think how you'll piece that together using a plot and a story. It's, it's a really hard thing to do. You can't just sit and think, okay, I'll say this and that will get my message across. It's not made up like that. It's, it is made up of all these small moments that point towards it. They're all tiny little chips in the sculpture that finally reveal the shape of it at the end. But in order to do that, like he says, you have to know the big truth so that those small truths can all contribute towards it. You have to know what you mean or what you want to write about or what your message is. However, the thing to remember about that, especially from a newer writer's point of view, is that you don't have to have this from day one. You can find that truth, that big truth, halfway through your book or at the end of it. You might not know what the message is until you finish reading the book and that's all right. That's okay, you can completely do that. That was something that held me back fairly early on because I thought, well, what am I writing this for? What matters about it? And I couldn't always find that, but I knew I liked the story, so I just kept writing it. And eventually something always did come to me. Something always revealed itself that this story was about. And it was through those small truths, I think sometimes they revealed the big truth, but I think definitely as long as you find that big truth either at the end or at the beginning, all those small truths then can contribute towards it. And then obviously the second interpretation is about how you build all of that, how you write a story and how you make everything make sense and how you make multiple plot lines slowly advance throughout the course of the book. You can't just do it in one big piece. It has to be loads of small pieces that make up the whole. But if you know what that story is that you want to tell, then you can see how all those small pieces go together. So I definitely agree with how he says if you get the big truth, the smaller truths accumulate around it. But I think the opposite can be true as well. I think small truths can build a picture of what that big truth might be. So good advice. Number three, if you have writer's block, you can cure it this evening by stopping what you're doing and writing something else. You pick the wrong subject. This one feels quite harsh to me. It's a little bit of tough love perhaps. And I don't necessarily agree that writer's block is always because you're writing about the wrong subject or you're writing the wrong thing. In my experience, which is of course in no way comparable to Ray Bradbury's, I'll just point that out. I tend to find writer's block comes because I've taken a wrong turn in something, not necessarily that the whole thing itself is wrong. I tend to find if I've taken the plot in a certain direction or taken a character down a certain road that they shouldn't have really gone down, that's when I tend to get stuck. The inspiration runs out. The vague idea of where I want things to go has veered off in another direction and I need to follow that instead of this new path that doesn't have anything pre-thought out. I would agree though, if you've got writer's block, you do need to stop and at least go back a bit. Even if that's not scrapping the whole project and writing something totally different, even if it's just going back a chapter or two. I've said this before, but most of the time, if you retrace your steps and allow a character to make a different decision or make a different decision yourself, that can often lead to you finding that path back to the rest of the story. Sometimes it comes down to time and experience as well. Even if that experience is just having written one more story the next week, sometimes that's enough for you to go back and find a way to finish the previous one because you've learned a little bit more or you learned something that might help you. So I don't necessarily agree that it's the wrong subject, but I definitely think you might be approaching it in slightly the wrong way. So I half agree, half disagree with that one. Number four, you've got to jump off the cliff all the time and build your wings on the way down. Definitely agree with this one. In terms of advancement and getting better and learning to write, there is no substitute for writing. I talk to a lot of writers and find that quite a few of them are stuck in analysis paralysis. Before they've even written a paragraph or a chapter of their book, they're thinking about, does it have the potential to do this? Will it be long enough? Have I approached this in the correct way? And all of that stuff needs to be figured out, but it doesn't need to be figured out right now. You've got time to let that stuff drop into place. The phrase I use when it comes to this kind of thing, which is a bit of a cliche, but I find it's useful, is the question of how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You can't just chomp that entire elephant in one go. You can't expect yourself to be equipped to do that. It's just impossible. You have to do it line by line. That's what Stephen King has said before when someone asked him, how did you write that book? He said one word at a time. And it sounded sarcastic, but really, it, it's true when you think about it. You don't have to choose all of those perfect words in one go and have the story be complete. The great thing about writing is you're just not required to get it right first time or second time or third time. You just, just, you just don't have to do it. But a lot of beginners I find treat themselves exactly like that. They write a chapter and expect to 
immediately know whether they have any innate talent with writing or whether this is something they're supposed to be doing or whether they can do it or they can't in one chapter and the first thing they've ever written. No one ever learned anything that way. It's a cycle, learn, write, repeat, learn, write, repeat. Stories never come out perfectly the first time. And if you are falling off that cliff and you fall all the way down to the bottom, that's all right. Because you can just reverse time and go back up to the top and try again and make different decisions on the way down this time. And nobody needs to know about it apart from you. You are gonna need to build those wings on the way down because before you write anything, you've no idea how big those wings need to be or how far you want them to take you. I'd say try not to think about writing a novel, if that's what you're doing, as writing a novel. Think of it as writing a chapter and then another chapter and another chapter. It's a lot more manageable and it's a lot easier and your expectations of yourself can be reduced a lot. So the pressure comes down. Allow yourself to build those wings on the way down. Don't expect everything to be perfect up front because it isn't for anyone. So definitely agree with that. Number five, to fail is to give up, but you're in the midst of a moving process. Nothing fails then, all goes on. This is something I strongly believe in and probably something I've talked about a lot on this channel already, but as long as you're still writing and you're still trying, there's no such thing as failure. Even if you get to the end of a novel or a story and you don't like anything about it and you wanna just throw it away without even editing it, which I've done on several occasions, it's still not a failure because you practiced skills in that, you learned new things, even if you don't necessarily recognize that in yourself. You leveled up slightly as a writer from writing that and all of that experience is worth having and it just adds to your writing acumen, I suppose. I'm gonna check that acumen means what I think it means. Kind of. The experience of writing something that doesn't end up working, I think is equally, if not more important than writing something that does work. How else other than making mistakes are we gonna figure out what doesn't work or what to avoid in the future? And of course, it's really discouraging when you finish writing something and you feel like it wasn't worth the time and energy that you put into it. I'm not saying that you're gonna finish something and feel like that and then think, but I feel great because I learned so much from it. I mean, people don't really work like that. You're probably more likely to wanna to throw your computer at the wall. It's all right to feel miserable about what you feel like was probably a waste of time, but all I'm saying is it probably wasn't as much of a waste of time as you think. You probably did still learn valuable stuff that you'll take with you onto future stories and future stories will be better for it, unless you completely give up. And I'm not talking about taking three months off or six months off or a year off, because a lot of people beat themselves up for not writing regularly, but as long as you do come back to it, everything that you learned will still be there. You'll still have all those skills and you'll still be able to warm up and get back to where you were eventually. I'm talking about stopping forever and thinking, I'm no good at this, I can't do it. The smallest amount of effort and energy towards writing, even if it's just something like watching a video like this, you're still helping yourself in some way. You're still working towards that end goal. If you need to start out small, just watching videos and stuff, that's great, but I would urge you to put pen to paper as soon as you can and just start that writing journey, I suppose. But whatever you do, don't stop completely because that, I do believe, as Ray Bradbury says, is the only failure when it comes to writing. So I definitely agree with that. Today I'm gonna to talk about writing advice from Maggie O'Farrell. She's written numerous really successful novels, including After You'd Gone and most recently Hamnet, which was just last year. I found loads of writing wisdom in interviews and in articles that she's written, so here's Maggie O'Farrell's tips for writers. Number one, you have to think of your fears and doubts as your friends because they're useful. I think that's really good advice for writers and it has more than one application because I think in this context, she probably means in terms of life experience and what fuels your story and what you're writing about, especially if you're writing from the heart. I think she's saying to expose your weaknesses and focus on things that have caused you harm or hurt or trauma is a good route to storytelling. And I think that's probably true in a lot of cases. Those things can fuel you to write a genuine story, an authentic story about something that you feel passionate about. and. That can never be a bad thing. And perhaps if you can't make those fears and doubts your friends, because that is a hugely difficult thing to do, I think then perhaps this advice might convince you at least not to avoid them or sidestep them because you're worried about writing them or you worry that your writing 
can't be equal to them. I think we can also look at it from a practical perspective when it comes to actual writing. Your fears and doubts might be the things that you feel like you're gonna struggle to write. And maybe that is just those fears and doubts, but maybe it's dialogue, maybe it's world setting, anything like that. If you feel like it's a weakness, I always think it's good to hit those things head on because the more you try and the more you practice with them, the better you get and suddenly you realize it's not a weakness anymore. It sounds really weird, but I do think of weaknesses as friends because all they are is pre-packaged, ready to go ways to improve. They're things that you can clearly identify rather than wondering about. They're things you know you need to get better at. So they're right there, ready for you to do it. I think in both contexts, this advice makes a lot of sense. So definitely agree with it. Number two, don't worry too much about knowing what you're doing at the beginning. You can start in the middle if you want, just put the words down. Really good advice, especially for beginners, I think. I struggled with this when I was first starting out with writing, as many people do, because the opening of a book or a story is so important. And everybody always says the opening is so important. You've got to grab your reader. You've got to give them a reason to keep going. You've got to make them invested in your story. But if you've never written anything before, that is such a tall order. I think with pretty much every longer piece of work I've ever done, I've changed the beginning multiple times. I've gone back to it and reworked it when I've figured out more about what my story is. It's never remained the same lines as what I put down. Short stuff does, but longer stuff definitely changes. Amending those opening lines, of course, is assuming that that's still gonna be where your story starts. It might not be. You might change it to, you know, something that came before or something came after. You might delete the entire first chapter. You don't really know, you've just got to start writing and see where it goes. You've got to have something in order to edit it and to build on it. What I especially like about what she said though is that you can start in the middle of your story if you want. There's nothing wrong with doing that whatsoever. If there's a point in your story that you're excited about or if it's the thing that prompted you to start writing this story in general and you're struggling to write an opening or figure out how you're gonna get there and you don't feel motivated to just spend 50,000 words trying to get to the one point that you wanna write, just write the part that you want to write. Because once you have that down, it might matter to you so much that you're willing to go through that first 50,000 words and willing to find all that because you've already written this part that you really love. Or else you might find that when you write the part that you really love, that is where the beginning of the story should be. Or that it might not be a longer piece of work, it might just be a short story, or it might be a novella. There's tons to gain by just writing something without thinking about how it fits into everything. Just get it down and you never know what it could turn into. So definitely agree with this too. Number three, stories will always find their own shape. They're like water. They'll fill whatever vacancy they're given. That's an interesting point, I think, that links into the last one in that it emphasizes that we don't always have a huge amount of control over the shape of our story. Before now, I've started out to write a piece of flash fiction and it's turned into something longer and the opposite has also happened, probably more often than not. I tend to write or intend to write something longer and end up with a really short piece of writing. It does happen. But more than that, especially when it comes to long fiction, I found that even if I didn't have all of the parts of the story, even if I didn't have a fully fleshed out story in front of me, as I've written, it's just filled in. Things have expanded to fill whatever space that I wanted it to occupy or that it needed to occupy. Whenever I've tried to control or artificially influence the length of a piece of writing, it's always ended badly for me. Longer works have ended up feeling really thin, shorter works have felt really compressed and compact. If a story needs more space, I think you tend to notice that pretty quickly, but if a story isn't gonna be as long as you initially thought or you hoped, it can sometimes take thousands of words to figure that out. And by that point, you're know, invested in a story and that can be a difficult thing. Over the past couple of years, I found that looking at literary journals or small publishers or small publications, they don't all prize 100,000 word novels. It, you know, There's a lot of space to sell shorter work or to get shorter work published, collections of short stories, flash fiction novellas, normal novellas. There is a place for all of that stuff. If the story just doesn't feel like it's gonna fit out that length, then it's not meant to be. And anything you add to it, in my experience at least, has weakened the story rather than strengthened it. Unless you get some kind of lightning strike of a good idea that you know is gonna fill out the rest of the book. That's probably different, but just adding filler in is probably what I'm talking about. And I wouldn't recommend that necessarily. Let the story fill out its own shape, like she says. I think that's really good advice. 
Number four, if you have trouble switching from your real world to your fictional one, try listening to the same piece of music over and over again until whatever surrounds you fades away. I've never tried this specifically with one piece of music over and over again, but I do tend to listen to the same playlists or records when I write so I can understand what she means. It definitely does help you get into the right mindset for writing. And I think it's less about music and more about how relaxed or how focused your mind is. You see it in every article about writer's block online. They're always suggesting go for a walk, have a shower, just sit and think about things. It's so that you can pause your mind, give your mind less to work on as you're you know, moving around, doing things, concentrating on things. Allow your mind a little more space in order to try and create something. Slowing down when it comes to problem solving definitely works better for me than just hyper-focusing on something and trying to work it out because I tend to just find I grind to a halt when that happens. I definitely recommend listening to music while you write though, uh, especially if you've never tried it before. It could be the thing that unlocks a bit of creativity within you. I know some people don't like listening to music with lyrics because it interferes with their train of thought and I get that, but you can also try instrumental music or film soundtracks, that's what I like to do, and you tend to find it does give you ideas sometimes or it does set your mind in that right mode like she talks about. It helps you to let go of your real world and enter into your fictional one for sure, so definitely agree with what she's saying here. Number five, towards the end it will be graft that gets you through. Know that you will redraft and rewrite your work 30, 40, 50 times. You'll examine and agonise over every comma, every semicolon, every adverb. I think this one is probably more to do with the individual writer than the overall craft of writing. But whenever I've written a really long piece of work, like a novel, and I've written about seven novels now, it's definitely been graft that gets me to the end of it. There's definitely a bit of excitement to finally finish the story mixed into it, but more often than not, you just really want to get it done and you're just putting pen to paper or hands to keyboards or whatever just to try to get finally get rid of this thing that you've been writing for potentially years, at least months. However, the part about redrafting your work 30, 40, 50 times I think is more down to individual writers, as I said. I don't really redraft stuff that many times. I, don't re I mean, it's probably hyperbole. She probably doesn't mean you're actually going to rewrite a novel 50 times, but... I tend to find I try to write very accurately and quite slowly the first in the first draft and then after that I'll edit two or three times maybe but I won't really change all of that much I'll just be making sure of the flow of the story and making sure really that I haven't missed anything and that there aren't errors as opposed to actually changing the phrasing or the shape of the story. I think the part about agonizing over every comma and adverb is really true for me when it comes to short fiction so I think a piece of punctuation can affect how a hundred word story feels and that's what I'm most often writing at the moment, that and a thousand word stories. But in a novel I don't think it has as much influence so I wouldn't really tend to worry about it in a larger piece of work. I definitely wouldn't agonise over it in something that long but I probably would in a hundred word story just because I can see more clearly. It never really goes out of your eye line because you can see the entire story on one page. You can always see that one little thing that's not quite right and I think that's definitely counts as agonizing. I think the thing to take away from this though and a useful way to look at it is that nothing you write no matter what kind of length of story you're writing is permanent. Everything is available to be changed, everything is optional, you can remove things, you can add things in, nothing has to stay the same so don't feel as though something is you know fixed in concrete and you have to curve your story around it because you just can't move it, you absolutely can. It might take some rewriting and some structural changes that you don't really want to make, but if it's going to be for the good of the story, then it's worth doing. I don't like editing. It's not my favourite part of writing. In fact, it's my least favourite part of writing, but every time I do it, it's really useful. So not all writers will redraft that many times or focus on such small things within their writing quite as much, but I definitely think we all have a, a little bit of that, at least in our writing, so I agree with it. Number six, every book teaches you something at the same time as filling you with a desire to put this new knowledge into practice, to try again. It's all part of the process. 
I like this one. This is about the never ending chase of writing and improvement and development. It might be slightly unhealthy of me, but the way I approach my writing is that everything I put down on paper, I want it to be better than the last thing. I want it to be the best thing I've ever written. And then when I come to write something else, I want to top that and make it even better. And I know that's unhealthy, but I don't, if I don't exactly manage it, then I'm not crushed or anything. It's just a way for me to make sure I don't stagnate and to keep going. And I think this might be what she's talking about. You can learn something when you're writing a longer piece of work. You can approach a piece of the story in a way that you've never done before. And then you think, wow, that's really good. I like that a lot. I didn't use it as much as I, I could have. Maybe in this next story, I can use that a lot more. And that'll be an even better story because of it. And then you write that story and you discover other things during the course of that. And then you move to another story and try to use all of those things. It never ends. And it's not always improvement, I don't think. Sometimes it's just changing how you do something to a different approach or a different format. Something that you knew about but never used before and thought maybe wasn't for you. You can definitely do that. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting any better or any worse as a writer. It's just changing things. But whether it is an improvement thing or it's just a sideways move that just helps you write a richer story in some way, there really is never an end point. It never really comes to the point where you're like, oh, I've learned everything. I'm as good as I'm ever gonna be now, so I'll just put all this stuff into practice. It never happens like that. You forget things that you already know, you learn things that you didn't. It's a never ending cycle. And if you're uncomfortable with that, then you'll find the more you write, the more you accept it, I think. Writers, I think, tend to be perfectionists. I certainly am. And sometimes that can be a real help, but most of the time, I think it's more likely to be a hindrance. But I think if you're able to accept that you can never be 100% efficient and you can't be a perfect writer, I think as long as you know that and you can work within the bounds of that limitation, then it tends, it tends to just work for you and help you keep going and it doesn't become something that drags you down and stops you from writing. There's no real final form for a writer, I don't think. At least in my experience, there isn't. I just tend to find I get incrementally better every so often and I'm just gonna chase that for the whole of my writing career, if you like. Today, I wanna to talk about Stephen King's writing advice. I probably don't need to explain who Stephen King is, and he's given a lot of writing advice over the years. I've read his book on writing, but I also found this list of his writing rules, which I'll link in the description. It's all fairly practical stuff, so I picked out a few that caught my eye. Number one, first write for yourself, then worry about the audience. I'm inclined to agree with this. I think some often heard but still useful writing advice is write the story that doesn't exist that you want to write, and I think that's especially for beginners, a way to keep yourself motivated to tell a story. If it's something that you're really interested in yourself, you're writing it for yourself, in a sense, to find out what happens for your own enjoyment as much as other people's, I think that's a good way to start out. Once you have a target audience in mind, I feel like that would have to somewhat limit the directions that you can take your story in. If you want to fit within the conventions of a certain genre or a certain type of story, then it feels like it closes down some avenues that otherwise might have been exciting to write. So. Yeah, I'd say I agree with this overall. I definitely think it's a good idea to write for yourself, first of all, because I think you find a lot of passion in doing that and you find a lot of excitement and that transfers to the reader. So yeah, I agree. Number two, don't use passive voice. Pretty often quoted and pretty useful writing advice, really. I'd say in 95% of cases, avoiding the passive voice is a good idea. It's as close to a rule with writing as you're gonna get, but of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. If you're writing a story that's made up of different types of storytelling, if you're using articles in your story or messages, or it's not just straight prose all the way through from a certain perspective, then some passive voice there isn't gonna harm at all, and it can even help to break things up and make it feel a bit fresh for your readers. So it's not a case of never ever use it under any circumstances, but it's a case of most of the time, it's pretty easy to just avoid it. For me, the reason why has always just been about distance. It makes your story feel further away for whoever's reading it, and it makes your characters feel more inaccessible. You can't get to know them as well because everything's passive and nothing, you don't know how they feel about anything. You're not being told how they feel about anything. They're just objects being moved around. And that doesn't really help anyone engage with your story. So I generally say definitely avoid passive voice most of the time. Number three, avoid adverbs. 
Pretty common writing advice, but equally useful, I think. However, this one's a bit more contentious. Some people don't mind adverbs at all. I don't mind them if they're kept to a minimum, but most of the time I would say to avoid them. The reason why is because for me, it feels really directed. It feels like the author is really directing you and just telling you how everything is going to be. So if they say he said something angrily, then fine, you know that information, but you don't really see it in your mind's eye. I prefer to try to create the effect that the word angrily would, would bring to a story using context and using what they actually say, how they say it, what their gestures are. I think that tends to bring the story to life a little bit more, but that's just my personal opinion. Other people are quite happy to do that with adverbs and they don't mind them in stories. Again, similar to the passive voice, you're gonna to need to use them every now and again, and that's fine. It's not a total blanket, never use them ever, but it's a case of maybe don't rely on them and ask someone when you're sending your story out to just check and make sure there aren't too many because that's something that does stand out to readers, I think. So I agree with this generally. Number four, avoid adverbs, especially after he said and she said. Pretty much the same tip, but I added it in because it's focused particularly on dialogue. It's difficult to explain how a person feels. Emotions and moods and stuff are hard to describe. So when a word comes along that perfectly does that for you, it seems like the obvious thing to just use that word. However, the drawback of doing that is that it can make your characters feel a little robotic. As I said before, you understand how they feel, but you don't really feel it. You don't understand it, you just know it. A bit like, you know, how I understand what a black hole is, but I've got no idea how it works. Again, there'll be times when you need to use this and it's just unavoidable and that's fine. But I would just say don't rely on it and don't depend on it to create meaning because then it becomes a crutch that you have to get past. And it's a lot harder to just try and face that head on from the beginning and learn how to create meaning in other ways. So I do agree with this one as well. Number five, but don't obsess over perfect grammar. Yeah, I agree with this as well, but I'd say don't in fact obsess over anything, especially in a first draft, just get the story down and get it finished. The first edit and the second edit, they're the times where you can really obsess over how everything is written and the nitty gritty of punctuation and stuff. One thing I'd add to this is don't worry about grammar at all when it comes to writing dialogue. People don't speak in a grammatically perfect way. It's just unnatural and it can make all of your characters sound exactly the same. So make sure people use colloquialisms, people use words wrong or people, maybe not words wrong necessarily, unless it's really clear that it's incorrect. Make sure you add a bit of variance to how your characters speak because generally that's more akin to real life than people just being absolutely perfect and pronouncing everything and forming sentences absolutely perfectly. Nobody does that, myself included. So. Yeah, generally agree with this. Number six, the magic is in you. I do agree with this one. And I think what occurs to me when I read that is to think about beginner writers, because a lot of the time when someone starts doing something for the very first time, what they feel like they need to do is go out and get all of the information. They need to learn all of the stuff. They need to understand how everything works and take that and absorb it into themselves. What they don't realize is that the most important parts of writing, they probably already have. It's how you feel about the writing, whether you're excited about the story that you wanna tell, how you wanna approach it. You can learn things, all of those things are tools that can help you get that out, but that stuff is already in you. Ideas always come from inside your mind and they're probably the most important source of energy as you're trying to write a whole story, but you already probably have that. If you're even thinking about writing a story, then you probably have an idea already and that's the most important part. Everything else you can go out and learn, but that stuff you've got to have and that, that magic is in you, as he says, so I agree. Number seven, you have three months. He talks about writing a book in three months or a season and I really disagree with this one. I've done that myself once. I spent quite a while planning a novel and then I wrote it all in three months. Furiously every day I wrote about 3,000 words and by the end of it, I absolutely hated it because that was not the way to write for me. This one's gonna be down to personal preference and you might not necessarily know whether this is too long or too short a time for you to write a book until you figure out how you work. Maybe it's because he's a professional and he's used to deadlines and getting things out to a whole host of other people that need to read the work. But I think especially when you're just starting out and you're not published yet, 
it takes as long as it takes. And as long as you're steadily working on it and you're still invested in the story, it doesn't really matter how long it takes. A question that I don't think really occurs to readers very much is, I wonder how long it took them to write this, unless the book is like really long, in which case they might, you know, legitimately wonder about that. But for an 100,000 word novel, no one's worrying about how long it took you. It seems a bit arbitrary to me to say three months. Why? What happens after three months? You don't forget the idea, it doesn't get wiped out of your mind. So I don't agree with this one. I think as long as you're still working on your project, as long as you still enjoy it and you still remember what the story is all about, you're fine. Do whatever you need to do and take as long as you need to take. Number eight, write one word at a time. This is something that I'm pretty sure he said in interviews when people ask him, how did you write this book? He says, one word at a time. And it might sound really sarcastic at first, but it's not. It's the most practical writing advice there is, I think. The reason I think it's such good advice is because if you take a beginner author or even a, an experienced author and say, write this novel, and you give them an idea for it, it's such a large undertaking. There's so many moving parts to it that it just it causes a block, at least for me, it causes a block in my brain. Like, where do I start? How do I approach this? What form do I even put this into? It's too cumbersome a thing to really control. But if you say, write the first chapter of a novel, that seems more doable. Or if you say, write the opening paragraph to a novel, that's even more doable still. There's no way to write a novel other than one word at a time. There is no other way to approach it. So it's the simplest answer. And it might seem sarcastic, but it makes a lot of sense. So I definitely agree with this. One word at a time, that's all you can do. Number nine, stick to your own style. I agree with this, but I think it's easier said than done. If I was gonna add to this, I would say find your own style rather than stick to your own style. Writers have influences for a reason. Things that affect how they write, things that they enjoy in other people's work that they want to apply to their own writing and that's natural and it's unavoidable really. If you read a lot, which most writers do, then you're naturally going to absorb some of the stuff that you love from other people's work. It's not plagiarism, it's a totally different thing, but it's really hard to balance doing that and also writing in your own voice. I think it's something that just comes from writing a lot and writing confidently, which is a whole other difficult thing. The first few novels I wrote, I definitely had someone else's work in mind when I was writing them, and as a result, they didn't turn out all that well. It seems really obvious now in hindsight that I was being too heavily affected by other people's work, but at the time I didn't really realize, I just admired it, and then I tried to write something that I thought was inspired by it, but really it was just too heavily influenced. My advice on this would be to try and check yourself. If you're writing a story and you're constantly reminded of another one that you love or that you're thinking about it all the time while you're writing, then it might be the case that you're being a little bit too heavily influenced. And some of that you might be able to get rid of in editing, but other times it, you might find that you've written fan fiction by accident. Happens sometimes. There's not much you can do about it. It's part of the writing journey. Once you do find your own voice, I feel like that's a permanent thing. You realize this is how I'm supposed to do things. And that influence becomes useful, but it doesn't overtake your work anymore. That's just how it's been for me, but everyone's gonna be different, I suppose. Number 10, the research shouldn't overshadow the story. I think this is a really good point. I tend to write literary fiction and short fiction, so I don't really have to do an awful lot of research or I don't find myself doing a huge amount of research. So there's no chance that it's really gonna overshadow my story. But if you're writing something like historical fiction or sci-fi, then you really do have to know your facts and those facts have to influence the direction of your story sometimes. I think the important thing would be to carefully pick and choose what you include in your story. Some things you might find really interesting about a particular time period or a particular aspect of science, and you might try to find a way to put that into your story, but it might not necessarily be the right thing to do. I think a good approach would be to think about what your story actually needs, what it requires in order to work and then to use research to inform that as opposed to just adding stuff into your story because it interests you or it sounds cool. That's pretty good advice for writing generally I think. Like I said though research doesn't come into my writing a huge amount so there's probably people with better informed opinions than me. Number 11 you become a writer simply by reading and writing. This is all about what a writer is, and that's a question that I've talked about on this channel many times. And I really like this stance from one of the most famously traditionally published authors on the planet. I don't know if this is exactly what he meant when he said this, but to me it means that publication and prizes and all that stuff 
doesn't make you a writer. Reading and writing and getting words down is enough to make you a writer. And I strongly believe in that. No matter what you want out of writing, even if you're aiming to be traditionally published, you're still a writer right now. You still do it, you still put words down. So you can call yourself a writer as far as I'm concerned. Today, I wanna to talk about Raymond Chandler's writing advice. He was a celebrated detective novelist and also a screenwriter, and his most famous work was probably The Big Sleep. That's definitely my personal favorite. So let's have a look at some of his tips for writers. Number one, a good story cannot be devised. It has to be distilled. That's one of his most famous quotes about writing, and I can see why, really. It does resonate with me. I'm all about talking about the complexity of writing. You'll know that if you've watched any of my other videos. And this quote really sums that up, I think. On paper, no pun intended, sometimes it really does seem like writing stories or writing novels is as simple as just devising the story and then getting it down. But the reality of writing, I think, is often a lot different from that. It's a slower process sometimes. It's a more complicated process. It's painstaking at times. So I think the idea of a story dripping slowly piece by piece into existence really makes a lot of sense and it will for a lot of other writers. And to me, that's reassuring as well. What he's basically saying here, I think, is that a story just doesn't arrive fully formed to him and then he just writes it down. It's not that simple. You just gotta monitor that distillation process and just watch as the story drips through for you. That definitely makes a lot of sense to me and hopefully it will to you as well. Number two, I write when I can and I don't write when I can't. This, I imagine, is probably a bit of a contentious point. That is how I operate. I write when I feel like writing, and when I don't, I just don't push it. But it's easy for me to do that because I'm most of the time writing very short fiction at the moment. I'm not working on a novel that I need to get done or that I want to get done. When you are working on a novel like that, it does make sense to push through those I don't feel like writing feelings and get something done. So I suppose it does depend on exactly what you're writing as to whether you'll identify with that particular tip. A lot of writers do push through that and they're still able to produce writing that they're proud of. And to me, I'm really envious of that. I'd love to be in a position where I could do that and be that productive while still keeping the you know, general quality level quite high. Unfortunately for me, and probably a lot of other writers, it works the opposite way for me. If I write fewer words in a session, I tend to be happier with them. So I think this depends on your preference and how productive you like to be and how much productivity matters to you and also what kind of project you're writing. But in general, I don't think it's bad advice at all, but I think it's very personal advice, so take it with a pinch of salt. Number three, the actual writing is what you live for. The rest is something you have to get through in order to arrive at that point. I'm not really sure whether by the rest he means extra writing tasks like research and prep and planning, or he means the rest as in the rest of life. In either case, I'm inclined to agree. If you've been around my channel for a while, you'll probably know I'm not much for planning. I'm not much for researching either. I tend to find those things just get in the way when I'm trying to write a story and I'll do them after the fact, if at all. But again, this is probably a preference thing, writer by writer rather than anything else. Some people get fueled to write a story by doing that research and that planning. That's what makes them excited to finally get that perfect story down on paper. But for me, if I do all that work up front, then I feel like I've already written most of the story, even though the words aren't down, and then I lose interest in actually crafting the story piece by piece. I suppose you could look at it from a productivity standpoint as well, where it's saying the most important thing is to just write something and everything else, don't worry about it, just make sure you keep writing. And in that case, I really do agree with that. If there's one task you need to do when it comes to making your writing better, it's right. You can procrastinate all you want with little tasks that might help you become a better writer or a more organized writer at least. But at the end of the day, you need to sit down and do the writing. That's where the main bulk of your learning and your experience is gonna come from and the main thing that will help you get better. That's certainly my opinion anyway, so I am inclined to agree with that point. Number four, when in doubt, have a man come through the door with a gun in his hand. That's a famous piece of advice as well. And obviously we need to look at that symbolically because not every story is gonna have men with guns. Although probably every story that Raymond Chandler wrote did. This I think will also separate the planners from the non-planners because the planners will already know whether a man's gonna come through that door with a gun in his hand or not. The non-planners, anything could happen. I tend to fall into the second camp, so a man with a gun could very well come storming into one of my stories and I'd have no idea until the point where I wrote him in. And to a large extent, I do agree with this tip. I think it helps to be unexpected, helps to surprise your readers when you're writing a story. However, 
I do think that man that storms in with a gun in his hand has to be 5 or maybe 10% planned at least. Otherwise, he's going to come totally out of left field and your readers aren't going to have a clue what's going on. In my opinion, you probably have to set that up at least a little bit. Or you have to create a world where that could happen. Otherwise, it's not going to seem plausible and it's going to seem like you just made it up off the top of your head. Which, of course, you did, but it shouldn't appear like that. I also think you can apply this quote to the craft of writing in general. For me personally, some of the best stories I've written or some of the ones that I like the most have come from absolutely nowhere. I've been writing a whole separate project and then this new story's come in and just taken over. Creativity generally works like that, I think, or at least it does for me. I can't decide when it's going to arrive or how long it's going to stay, so I better write that story while it's still around. What I take from that is to leave the door ajar a little so that man with a gun can come through and give me a new story rather than locking him out and closing myself off to that possibility. Number five, technique alone is never enough. You have to have passion. Technique alone is just an embroidered potholder. I really like this quote and it may not surprise you because I talk about passion in writing fairly often in my videos and I think it's got to be the driving force behind whatever story you're telling. I agree with him. Technique alone cannot sustain an entire story. Not a short story, and definitely not a novel. Nice writing for the sake of nice writing might impress other writers in the short term, but it won't keep a reader interested for pages and pages of your work. That passion, I agree, has to be there. It has to be what prompted your story in the first place, and it has to be what you're following through the duration of writing it. Of course, you can use that technique even in the first draft of your story and write it as nicely as possible, as long as that passion is still there because technique can't replace it. It can just become the gilded edges of a story that already matters. Once you've figured out what that passion is that's driving your story, and I've made tons of videos about this, you don't have to change the world with the message of your story. It just has to be something specific that you can follow through until you've written the whole thing. Once you've got that, you can absolutely apply those techniques or go back and correct them or fine tune them. But I think the driving force always has to be the passion. So I strongly agree with that one. Number six, the challenge is to write about real things magically. That's a great quote, I think. It's a very complicated subject boiled down to a very easy to digest message. That quote, I think, speaks to me more than any of the other quotes, and I find that it aligns with my view of writing more than anything else. Stories have to have actions and events and things happening and people going places, but on top of that, to make a story feel whole, in my opinion, you have to have that magic. And to me, that's not about making things grand or unbelievable. It's about finding those little moments that carry weight in everyone's life that maybe we don't have a name for and just weaving that into your story on top of those actions and events. And when he says real things, I don't take that as a comment on genre whatsoever. He's not saying you can't write fantasy or sci-fi because those aren't real things or real places or whatever. I think he's talking about people. Those real things he's talking about are happening to people, their experiences, their the human condition, because there is no story without people. No matter what genre you write in, it's always about people. I've read quite a few of Raymond Chandler's books and they are about real things. They're people opening cigarette packets, they're people having drinks, they're people driving places, but he always has that element of magic on top, which is what makes the stories rich and what makes you keep turning the page time and time again. I thought about this magic before when it comes to my own writing and it really has driven me to write some better stories than when I just thought, what could happen in this story? What could happen is just the platform. The magic has to be on top, otherwise it's not gonna feel like a complete story or it's not gonna be all of the story that it could be. So I definitely agree with that point as well. If you take nothing else from this video, I'd encourage you to try and do that. Add a little bit of magic to your writing and see what happens. George Orwell had some really useful and practical writing rules that I think any writer could put to good use. His most famous work was probably his dystopian classic 1984, but whatever he wrote, he wrote it with fearlessness and a biting critical eye on society. Here's some of those writing rules. Never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. That makes sense. You might think that a phrase that a reader's seen a million times might just float under the radar and it won't be noticed because it's not disruptive and it's not off-putting. And to some extent, that might be true. But to me, whenever I read a phrase like that, it makes me start assessing the writing instead of enjoying the story. 
that could just be a writer thing. After all, we think about how stories are written way more than the average reader would. But as I said, anything that makes me think about the writing process as opposed to the actual story tends to be a bit of an immersion killer. To counter that, one practical thing that I like to do is to reject the first simile or metaphor that comes to mind. Not only does that help to make my writing less predictable, at least I hope so, but it also slows me down and gives me more time to think and more thought often leads to a better phrase. Not always, but most of the time. Never use a long word where a short one will do. I agree with this and I think it's worth following. I think Orwell's intention for this rule was to create simplicity and maximize meaning in what he was writing. Telling a story is communication. So as writers, it's up to us to make our stories as easy to understand and easy to read as possible. That works to our advantage too, because readers don't often give up on a story because it's too easy to read, but they might give up on a story if it's too difficult. Never use long words, ever. Got it. That's not what I said. Yep, it was. If it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Like the last tip, it's all about clarity and prioritizing meaning over phrasing. Beautiful and complex writing absolutely has value, but it's just not always the best way to tell a story. If you cut unnecessary words, your sentences will have more impact, they'll read a little bit quicker, and they'll probably feel a little more interesting too. But for the first draft of anything, I'd say write what you want and focus on the meaning of it. Then you can worry about cutting and simplifying in editing. Why use lot word when few word do trick. Yeah, you probably want to leave a few more in. Never use the passive where you can use the active. Very common advice, but for very good reason. The passive voice creates distance for your readers and it's a barrier to their immersion. It reminds them that they're reading a story, so it should be avoided. When you first start out with writing, the passive voice can feel like a safety net of sorts. It feels less forthright and a little bit quieter, kind of like you're mumbling your story. But really, every story is better told in a clear, loud voice, so have confidence, be direct and active. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. I generally agree with this one, especially when we're talking about simplicity. It's better to use everyday language where you can. However, I'm not exactly sure I'd say never. No, I, I am sure. I'd never say never in this case. My main worry is dialogue. People speak differently, so there needs to be a difference in how people sound. If you had a scientist character, for example, I'd expect her to use scientific terms. You don't want to end up with every single character sounding exactly the same because it's boring and it isn't believable. For me, this tip's definitely one to be aware of, just not necessarily one to follow all the time. Well, that's not confusing at all. Hang on, wait for the next tip and listen to it. Break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. This is the big secret, no rule is ever really a rule. If you followed all these rules all the time, it would be difficult to write anything, never mind anything good. Better to break a couple of rules and come out with a story than to follow all of them and come out with nothing. Some of the best works of art are created when the rules are broken. I think it's just about finding balance so that what you write still has meaning and depth to your readers. I read some writing advice from John Steinbeck this week and it raised some interesting questions for me about how us writers approach our stories. He's most famous for Of Mice and Men, The Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden, but here's some of John Steinbeck's advice for writers. Abandon the idea that you're ever going to finish. Lose track of the 400 pages and write just one page for each day. Then, when it gets finished, you're always surprised. I think that's really good advice, in theory but it's probably easier said than done. Especially when you're writing regularly and you sit down every day to write something, it's really hard not to think about your overall progress. That need to constantly measure progress is one of the things I like least about writing novels and it's one of the things that put me off for quite some time. I would imagine it could be that way for quite a few writers. I would actually argue that finding a way to stop measuring how far you are through your current project is actually beneficial for your writing. I think it means that you're not thinking about how many words you have left or how many words you've got down so far. You're not stopping thinking, yeah, but this, this is only 30,000 words so far, so I need to find something to fill it with. Instead, you're just following the natural course of the story and it ends up being as long or as short as it's supposed to be. And that 
but ultimately disappointing if you're trying to write a really long novel and you don't get there in word count. I think it's still beneficial for the story in general because that's how long it was supposed to be and you're not filling it with filler. Something I think makes this advice even more interesting is thinking about how technology has impacted writing because I think it would be way easier to put one page aside every day if you were writing on a typewriter or by hand. There's no page number at the bottom and you can't just make a couple of clicks and figure out what your overall word count is. You just do your page, and move on. And I think you could definitely still do that today even with all our new technology. I just think it's difficult to resist the urge to check in on your word count every now and again. And I think it's, it's hard to just write that one page and then leave it. I think it would take an awful lot of self-control self-control that I don't have. I think that would definitely be an interesting experiment somewhere down the line. I'm switching to typewriter for a few months just to see if my overall feeling on how my project is progressing is the same or different or if it has any effect at all. Whatever the case, I think not checking your word count before you write, while you're writing and after you're writing would no doubt be a good thing. So I agree with that tip. Never correct or rewrite until the whole thing is down. Rewriting process is usually found to be an excuse for not going on. In many ways, true I think. Rewriting in the middle of a draft for me has usually meant death for whatever I was writing. It seems to be one of those inevitable patterns for me that I just can't get past whenever I'm writing, especially a novel, because I just want to make sure everything's good first time. And to, to some extent you think, well, if this isn't right right now, how can I go on? How can I stand the rest of the novel on top of this? But you actually can, it doesn't have to be perfect. And most of the time when you look back at things you've already written, when you're outside of it or when the whole draft's finished, it's probably not half as bad as you think it is or as half as detrimental to the rest of the story as you think it is anyway, but I still can't help doing it. However, I acknowledge that that's just something that happens to me. That's my particular affliction. That might not be the case for every writer. In fact, it definitely won't be. For some writers, rewriting and making the first part perfect before you move on to the second part might be just part of their method. It might be how they get through stories. And if they do, by the end of the first draft, I would imagine that the story will be in fantastic shape compared to a lot of first drafts. Also, I think it depends what you're writing. I would definitely rewrite parts of a flash fiction, for example, sentences or the previous paragraph before I finish the whole thing and not think about that as a big deal at all. That, that to me, doesn't even really count as rewriting process in the same way that it does for a chapter of a book. I think because with shorter stuff you have to be so hyper focused on how everything's written, it often means the difference between whether the story is going to land or not, whereas one sentence in a novel isn't going to make comparatively as much difference, I would argue. Overall though, I do agree with what Steinbeck said here. I think for the majority of writers, rewriting process probably is some form of procrastination. In writing, your audience is one single reader. I found that sometimes it helps to pick out one person, a real person you know or an imagined person, and write to that one. This is the same concept as an ideal reader, and I think that's something that Stephen King talks about. I think it's Stephen King anyway. I think it makes sense. The idea of writing something that will please a thousand people seems almost impossible. After all, we all know how hard it is to write something that will please one person. But when you do focus on that one person, you can start thinking about how they might receive different parts of your story. It gives you at least something to go off when you're thinking about how to phrase certain things or from what angle you should tell your story. It gives you some idea of just what you're trying to achieve with it if you think about who the ideal reader might be. If you don't try and narrow your focus to one person, and usually it helps if that's a friendly face, then you leave yourself vulnerable to this idea that there's thousands of different people that you have to please all simultaneously, and I don't know any writer that could ever do that. I suppose what I'm talking about is the transferring of some kind of message. If you're in a room with one person, then it's very easy to transfer a message to them. But if you're in a room with a million people from different walks of life who speak different languages and want different things from your story, you can't really simultaneously deliver that message that's going to satisfy all of them. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone apart from me, but I definitely think it's good practice to imagine who will be reading your story. It doesn't even have to be a real person, as Steinbeck says, but it needs to be one person, one receiver of what you're trying to do, one person to pass the message along to, helps a lot. If a scene or a section gets the better of you and you still think you want it, bypass it and go on. When you finish the whole, you can come back to it and then you may find that the reason it gave you trouble is because it didn't belong there. I should definitely take better notice of this as I'm writing. And to me, this raises a question in my mind. Do stories 
have autonomy of their own. There have definitely been times where I've been writing a story and I've been certain about the direction that I'm taking it in and then when I got there, the story had other ideas and it's gone in a completely different direction. Most of those occasions, I think, have turned out better for the story than what I'd imagined in the first place, so it's worked to my advantage. But I suppose the opposite could be true as well. There's definitely some benefit to planning everything ahead and then sticking to the plan, because if you do deviate, even if the story calls for it, then anything else you've got planned further down the line, which maybe the book is depending on, stuff like a plot twist or certain information given at a certain time can be altered and then it can be difficult to wrangle the whole thing back into line. I suppose it brings us back to the ever-present question of which is better, planning or discovery writing, and there is no better. Everything works differently for every writer in every project. For me, I aim for a kind of hybrid approach where all of the main parts of the story and all, all of the screws that hold the story in place stay where they are and then I improvise around that. So I'll decide just how I want to do things as I get to them rather than in advance. That way I stay interested enough because I feel like I haven't told myself the full story yet, but I also know where I want to go next and I'm able to stick to something that might actually propel me through the story. But there's no doubt about it, I've definitely ground to a halt in the middle of some scenes and lost all my motivation for writing because I've arrived in the wrong place. Whether that was myself and my planning that brought me there or it was the story taking a turn that I wasn't expecting, one way or the other, the solution is usually to go back and check if you followed the signs correctly. For me, it's just another advertisement for writing a little bit slower so that you have time to figure out where you're going before you have to slam the brakes on. However, there definitely comes a point where slowly and carefully considering everything you write becomes another form of procrastination. If you're using dialogue, say it aloud as you write it. Only then will it have the sound of speech. Another writer reminded me of this just this week in the comments section of one of my other videos, and it's something I've always wanted to try and never got around to. And it does make sense. Surely if you want speech to sound like speech, it should be spoken. Can't really attest to whether it does or doesn't work. It's something I'm definitely going to try in the future. And the only reason that I haven't yet tried it is this weird form of embarrassment. I don't know why I'm embarrassed to read my own dialogue back to myself, even if no one else can hear me, when I'm capable of sitting in front of a camera and talking about writing that I've managed to get past that particular barrier, but this one is just too much for me. I can't do it. I think it's important because unnatural sounding dialogue is a big turnoff for a lot of readers, myself included. You might not think that dialogue is even a weakness in your own writing. I don't think it's a particular weakness in mine, but that doesn't mean it can't be made better. That doesn't mean it can't be improved. And if a simple way to improve prove it is just to read it out loud, everyone has access to that. Overall, I think dialogue is make or break for a story, and if you can get it to sound natural, it's just another level of immersion for your readers, and I think that's always a good thing. I'll try reading my dialogue out loud at some point in the future, and hopefully it'll work for me as it's worked for a lot of other writers, it seems. If there's a magic in story writing, and I'm convinced there is, no one has ever been able to reduce it to a recipe that can be passed from one person to another. The formula seems to lie solely in the aching urge of the writer to convey something he feels important to the reader. I believe this is the very beating heart of your story and the reason why some stories don't work out. The urge to convey a story or a message to a reader, I think, gives you more energy and more motivation than pretty much any other source I can think of. But how it arrives and how to make it stay, I think, is still pretty much a mystery, certainly is to me. As John Steinbeck says, it's magic. I've written plenty of stories myself and plenty of books without that aching urge of the writer, as Steinbeck puts it and most of those ended up not even being finished or not even getting anywhere near finished. That's because I didn't have that force that was propelling me through the story. All I had was, this seems like a cool idea, or I really like this particular plot twist, so I'm gonna build an entire book around it. And because of that, the stories were forgettable, they were easy to zone out of, and they weren't immersive in any way. That reason, if I'd had it to keep putting words down, would have been the exact same reason, whether they could define it or not, that a reader would stay immersed in the story. The name Hemingway is synonymous with all things writing, and his letters to other writers are jam-packed full of insights into his process and his methods that we writers can steal and use for ourselves. So I've picked out some of the best ones. The best way is always to stop when you're going good and when you know what will happen next. If you do that every day when you're writing a novel, you'll never be stuck. 
This might be the most useful piece of practical writing advice that I've seen. If you write novels, or if you write anything really, you're probably familiar with the feeling of getting down on paper everything that you had planned or everything that you wanted to say and drawing a line under it, and then coming back the next day, sitting down and facing a blank page. It's so much harder to get going when you need to figure out where you're going at the same time. It's harder to accelerate to a good speed when you're starting with the brakes on. But if you resist the urge to keep going while you've still got ideas in mind and you're still enjoying writing and you don't really want to stop, then you'll be all the more excited when you sit down to write the next time you come to it. You'll get up to speed so much quicker and then while you're in that state it's much easier to figure out where you need to go next. And this doesn't just apply to discovery writers either. If you're a planner and you've got a bullet point list of everything that you want to happen in your novel you can still end up getting to that point where you feel like you're out of ammo. Leaving a little bit of story there or not quite finishing a section I think is a great way to just get yourself started again the next time you sit down to continue your story. Imagine never sitting in front of a blank page and not knowing where to go next. It's pretty valuable. I love to write but it's never gotten any easier to do and you can't expect it to if you keep trying for something better than you can do. This is the struggle constantly wanting to feel more comfortable and better at writing so that you can be more productive, so that it feels easier, so that it doesn't take as long. The thing is though, I think Hemingway's right. If you want to get better at writing, then you're always gonna feel somewhat uncomfortable and it's always gonna feel difficult because you're constantly learning new skills that you wanted to put into practice and building on them and learning new ones and building on them. That's how you become a better writer and it's a goal that's worth going for. But by itself, I don't think it necessarily means all that much. Where the meaning comes in, I think, is that getting better allows you to write better stories, bigger stories, more complex stories. All of that stuff, you'll probably love writing, but as Hemingway said, it won't feel easier. The only way writing ever feels remotely easy to me is when I've settled into something that I already know I'm gonna feel quite comfortable writing. And purposefully or not, whenever I'm writing something like that, I'm hiding from the parts of writing that will really challenge me and force me to get better. And the question I always come back to then is, if that's the case, is that the kind of writing that I really want to write? I think we should never be too pessimistic about what we know we've done well, because we should have some reward, and the only reward is that which is within ourselves. Publicity, admiration, adulation, or simply being fashionable are all worthless. This is something I'm terrible at. I never give myself any credit for the things that I've achieved with my writing. It's something I'm working on trying to get better at. But as well as that, this tip brings to mind the word honesty for me. And in particular, being honest about what motivates you as a writer and being honest about that with yourself. A cycle that I think it's really easy to fall into is to start a novel full of confidence that you're gonna get it published. And then a little way in you think, hmm, maybe it's not quite as publishable as I thought. And then you decide, yeah, definitely I'm going to struggle to get this published. And then you veer off a little bit and go, well, maybe, maybe I don't want it to be published. In fact, yeah, definitely I don't want it to be published. I'm just writing this for me. Yeah, all my satisfaction just comes from having done it. That's all I need. I've fallen into this cycle myself many times before and I'll probably do it again, but is it true? Honestly, do I just get satisfaction from writing and am I happy with that? And is that what I do it for? Or is there some kind of element of hoping for success and outside validation too. Of course there is, there always will be. But I think what Hemingway said about finding reward within yourself is really important because that kind of reward is available to every single writer. We can all take pride in what we do and satisfaction in having written it if we can figure out how to do it mentally. But unfortunately, the other kind of outside validation reward just isn't available to most writers. So that inner reward is all the more important because it's probably the only one most of us will ever get. Another reason that the word honesty came to mind when I read that tip is because I don't think I agree with Hemingway. I think if you're motivated by outside validation, if you want to hit those bestseller lists or make a bunch of money with your writing, I think that's all right. I think it's fine to use that as your motivation. If you're dissatisfied with what you've achieved with your writing or you want to achieve more, I think that can spur you on in the same way that being pleased with what you've written can. It's okay, I think, if chasing success is your driving force. I think the fuel is less important than the direction that you steer the car in. It's all very well for you to write simply, and the simpler the better, but do not start to think so damn simply. Know how complicated it is, and then state it simply. 
This tip is a better version of an often recited piece of writing advice about stating everything in simple terms and using plain English in your stories. And that tip probably came from this letter of Hemingway's because he's well known for doing exactly that in his stories. However, unlike the Cliff Notes version, I think there's actually a bit more nuance to what Hemingway's saying here than just use plain English. I don't think it's really about those words, or they shouldn't be the focus anyway. It's about the thing that you're trying to describe, that complicated thing, as he says. It's not about making sure your entire book is written in such clear and simple language that no one could ever misunderstand even a one line of it. It's about taking something complicated and complex and vague and dense and stating that as simply as you can. It makes me think of those hyper-realistic statues you see that are just incredibly elaborate, but they were created using a hammer and chisel, the simplest of tools. That's probably a bit of a cliche, I know, but that's because there's an element of truth to it. The easiest way to communicate something to another person, or in this case, a reader, is to make it as clear and unambiguous as you can by avoiding words like unambiguous, probably. Invention is the finest thing, but you cannot invent anything that would not actually happen. This is what we're supposed to do when we're at our best, make it all up, but make it up so truly that later it'll happen that way. This one strikes pure fear into my heart as someone that's just come back to novel writing from a long holiday in short fiction. Credible, authentic, realistic, these are all things that stories should be and all things that are really difficult to actually apply to your writing. I'm constantly asking myself, would that really happen? Would this person really do that? Is that how that works? But at the same time, I'm trying to steer the plot where I need it to go. There's parts of the plot that absolutely have to happen, otherwise the story won't make sense. But I worry that people will read it and then say, I don't think so, mate. I love being immersed in a story when I read and that's what I want to give to whoever reads my writing, but immersive stories aren't filled with unrealistic things and things that would never happen. It's a constant battle between being realistic and moving the plot where it needs to go, and something that helps me, I think, is to try to define exactly what needs to be realistic, or as Hemingway says, what has to be made up, but made up truly. If we were making everything that we ever write completely realistic, then fiction itself wouldn't exist, never mind stuff like sci-fi and fantasy where there are worlds that don't exist and forces that defy the laws of physics. However, those stories do exist and a lot of them are really realistic. That's because in my opinion, this concept of writing truly applies most not to the genre or the setting of a book, but to the characters and specifically the choices and decisions that a character makes. We all know that readers have to empathize with a character in order to really get into a story. They have to feel like the choices or situations that a character is facing are in some way real. So if you think back to the last time you said, well, that's totally unrealistic when you were reading something or watching something, I bet it's because a choice that a character made or some action that they took made no sense. From what you know to be true human behavior from your many years spent being a human, it's all too obvious when a character's actions or choices don't reflect their motivation or their situation. If you feel that in your writing, then that's a good time to go back over what you've written and to figure out whether you are writing truly. If a character really would never do the thing they've done, but they have to for the plot, then go back, change earlier decisions, move things around until either it makes sense for the character to make that choice or they have no other option. Otherwise, in my opinion, you risk making your readers roll their eyes and then the impact of anything that happens afterwards in the story is a bit diminished. Once you're into the novel, you have to go on. So there's no sense to worry. As soon as you start to think about it, stop it. Think about something else. You have to learn that to write a novel. The hard part about a novel is to finish it. We've all heard the writing advice that the hardest part of any novel is finishing it. It's often recited advice, but that's because it's true. But I think there's a little more nuance in Hemingway's words here if we look for it. There's no sense to worry. He's not, say he's not saying just be disciplined and keep writing. And he's not saying put the effort in and work hard at your writing. He's saying don't worry, just keep going. You won't have all the answers. You won't always feel like you're up to the task. You might not feel like you have any idea what you're doing. Don't worry, just keep going. My favorite quote about writing is this one from Gene Wolfe, and I'm pretty sure I've already recited this multiple times on my channel. You never learn to write a novel, you just learn to write the novel that you're writing. I've written seven different novels, some of them just first drafts, but most of them completed, and every single one of them has felt like that to me. They all needed totally different treatment, they all needed different parts to make them. I didn't know completely what I was doing with 
any of them really. And some of them I'm quite happy with. I like them even though I chose not to do anything with them. None of them came out really terrible. I'll be honest, not knowing is a huge part of the writing process for me. You can't always know if you're doing a great job as you're writing a first draft of anything and constantly trying to know that can really slow your progress. I don't know if my current book is gonna work or to some extent where I'm exactly going with it, but I'm just gonna keep writing until it's finished. There's no sense to worry. But of course, it's not that simple. There's always gonna be things that occupy your mind as you're writing. It's only natural, but the key, I think, is to hear those things and just keep writing anyway. A lot of writing is about momentum. Once you get going, just ensuring that you keep moving, keep writing at a sustainable and steady pace, whatever that is for you. That can be all it takes to make the difference between a half finished, half imagined story and a completed first draft, especially if it's your first novel. Something that I think is well worth remembering is that there's far more than one way to tell a story. And knowing that and embracing that can really help to break down some of those productivity barriers because how you write a story is every bit as important to your productivity and how the thing turns out as what you actually write. Have a think about how you're writing your novel. Justin Cronin is the author of the hugely successful Passage trilogy, which is a post-apocalyptic sci-fi horror series, which really does cross genres. That's one of the things that I like about the series, especially the first book, and that genre-crossing quality to his writing is the subject of the first piece of advice I want to read from him. I found out to my relief that you just write how you write. There were not two writers, one the genre guy and one the literary guy. It was just me working in two shops. It's refreshing to hear this from a traditionally published and really successful author because usually I find that the advice that gets given when it comes to crossing genre is to avoid it because you're looking to target your book at a specific audience and market your book to specific types of people and it does generally, I think, make it more difficult to get published if you jump between genres. I've queried several books to literary agents since I began writing and a lot of the time my own writing tends to span across several genres. It tends to be like crime or sci-fi with a hint of literary fiction to it and that makes it really difficult to place. As I've said tons of times, I've had agents come back to me and say, we like the writing, but we just don't know what to do with it because nobody takes this kind of thing. So in that way, it's nice for someone to acknowledge that it can happen, no matter how rare or how unlikely it might be, you can get this stuff published. And if that's the kind of story that's coming from you and that's the story that you want to write, absolutely carry on writing it. That's what I'm doing. I know that by the time I finish my book, there might be little demand for it, but I don't really care that much. I just want to write the story that I want to write. It's just nice to have that acknowledged by an author who's done it. So if you're like me and you're writing a cross genre kind of book, then just keep going because you never know where it could end up. I believe that creativity requires a form of auto hypnosis in order to work. You need to put your mind in a state where the unconscious mind, where all the interesting connections are made, where metaphors are built, you have to be able to lift that dream state closer to your waking state. Otherwise, the book's just building an engine, not creating something interesting. This says a lot about writing routine, I think. And one huge mistake I've made in my writing routine is to focus solely on that word of writing and not focus too much on thinking. You might know from my previous videos, I don't plot out my entire books all the way through. So I don't spend that time upfront figuring out how everything's gonna work. I figure it out as I go. And then of course, the tendency is that I'll just write and keep writing. And as long as words keep coming to me, I'll just write them down. And I won't think too much about all of the, the stuff that needs to go into it. But if you do take some time and really think about your story and get into that auto-hypnosis dream state where you're just considering all aspects of the, the story that you're telling, it can definitely help you figure out where you need to take it. In the interview this is taken from, he's actually talking about running. That's his auto-hypnosis dream state. That's where he can sort of shut everything off and just run and think about his story. And then when he gets back, he writes it all. That's similar in approach, I think, to Haruki Murakami. Whether you plot or you don't plot, I would really recommend finding a way to do this. For me personally, it's before I go to bed every night, when I'm trying to fall asleep, I think about my story and you'd be surprised just without any other distractions on your mind, how much you can actually think of and how many answers to questions just come to you. But it doesn't have to be even that big of a thing. It doesn't have to be part of your daily routine. It can be while you're writing. Just stop for a while. If you come to a halt or a bump in the road, just stop for a few minutes. Sometimes I like to just close my eyes and lean back in my chair for a while and answers will generally come to me when I do that. 
but not answers necessarily because I'm not talking about puzzles all the time, but just sometimes an idea of something will come to me that wouldn't have if I just kept rolling on. I especially like the end of this tip where he's talking about without all that stuff, you're just, right, you're just building an engine. You're not creating something interesting. That's definitely happened in my previous books. I've just been writing and writing and writing on and on like a locomotive. There's no thought to it whatsoever. I'm just shoving fuel in and off I go all the way to the end of the book. And it really shows on those times. I finish the book, read the finished article back, and I can tell there's no soul to it because I haven't stopped to think long enough to take the story where it needs to be as opposed to just where it can be. So I'd say definitely take note of this one and think about your story, spend some time with an empty mind, and it really can affect your story in ways that you wouldn't expect. I always end my books badly. My books are about 1100 pages long in manuscript. I find the first half great, and then in the second half, something goes wrong. I end up in the wrong spot, or it's just underwhelming. So I have to go back and rewrite the second half of the book. I can immediately relate to this, because I often find the second halves of my books underwhelming too. And I think it's because of that last tip as well. Because once I've got into the rhythm of writing and I'm putting down chapter after chapter, I've stopped thinking. That's when things become underwhelming because things just happen because, I don't know, I've got to get to the next plot point somehow, so yeah, that will do. When you get to the that will do stage of your writing, you're going in the wrong direction, or at least you need to stop and think about it a bit more. Unlike Justin Cronin, I am not capable of going back through the latter half of my finished book and writing it again. I don't have the patience for it. By the time I get to the end, I feel like I've gone so far off course in these books where it's happened that I just, it's not recoverable, so I just don't. That's definitely a skill that I need to learn and try and put some time and energy into. Because it's worth remembering, all the enthusiasm that you have about your story at the start of the book is valid and it makes sense and it applies to what could be an entire book. It's not like you just really love the first half and you, you know, the second half you're not bothered about. You love the entire story that you've thought up and that will carry through if you let it, if you don't rush through and just try to continue it and finish it as quick as possible. There's no doubt about it, the second half of a book is harder than the first half because you don't have necessarily all of that enthusiasm and all of that energy to keep writing it because it's hard. It's difficult to sit down day after day and just chip away at something while also concentrating on everything about it that you love and that makes it great because it can feel like work a lot of the time. So you need to stop every now and again and remind yourself what you're trying to do with the book what excited you about it in the first place because that will bleed through the pages to your reader. Aside from that, the first half of any book is pure creation. You're opening all these plot lines and you're creating these threads. The second half, you're trying to pull all of those together and make them go where you want to. The second half is always going to be harder. The first half is wide open, the second half not so much. But when you think about it, it's the second half really that's more important. By the time you get to that second half, your reader is invested in your characters, they're invested in your story, they want to see it come to a satisfying conclusion, and that's really hard to do. But I definitely need to learn this, I need to get better at going back and assessing what needs to change, and not just thinking, ah, oh, forget it, I can't be bothered now. That's a big failing on my part, and with this book that I'm writing now, I'm really hoping that I'm not gonna have to do that. I'm nearing the middle of it now, and I still feel the same kind of energy as I did when I started, so hopefully it'll carry through a bit longer before I run out of steam, but I will run out of steam eventually. When I do, just need to be patient with myself. Think about it, like I said. Hopefully, that'll mean I have less to do when I get to the end of it, but it's always gonna be work. My motto's always been, write the book that wants to be written. The passage wanted to be written. I think you can really tell from how the story crosses genres. It's not that he wanted to do that, or he wanted his book to fit into several of these categories. It's just where the story needed to go. It just happens to have elements of sci-fi and happens to have elements of horror. It's just the way it was leading him. I've written books before that I amended to fit into a certain genre and that I changed my direction of when I realized I was crossing over and they always ended up not great. And they always ended up a little bit soulless and boring and underwhelming, as he said before. But the stuff that I've written without any regard for that, the stuff that I've written just because it, I was excited by the idea and I wanted to follow it through, those are always the better stories for me. I don't think that any amount of research or determination to make your book fit somewhere can ever replace the energy or the like organic energy you get from being interested in your story and being inspired to write it. I just don't think you can write a story that's as good 
if you're intentionally aiming it somewhere. I think you just have to let it play out in front of you. I certainly do anyway. Maybe I'm just speaking for every writer when really I should be speaking just for myself. Whatever the case, I think if you feel that push to tell your story, you're on the right track. Follow that. Don't follow where you think it should be. Don't follow all the questions that pop up to you as you're writing. Just follow what feels right to you and what feels exciting to, to write. And it probably will be to a reader as well. Half the human race is women. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't take their points of view and use whatever powers I possess as a writer to imagine their experience. Without a doubt, there is a huge problem across literature and film and everything about the portrayal of women characters by male authors. Too often I'll DNF a book or my wife will show me a paragraph of just embarrassing writing where a man has just described a woman by her physical appearance for no apparent reason that doesn't add anything to the story and it's clear that that character has been written as an amusement or an object for the male characters in the in the book. It happens depressingly often. If you're on the right side of social media, you'll see posts all the time of usually women reading out paragraphs of just awful writing by men that just completely objectifies women for no other reason than just their own amusement or the amusement of, I assume, a male readership. I think a really solid idea is to think about how and why you're describing your women characters. For example, if you feel no great urge to describe the anatomy of your male characters, why do you feel it's necessary to describe those of your female characters? Is it to add to your plot or is it required for your reader to understand what's happening in your book? If not, something to strongly consider. And as he says, he wouldn't be doing his job if he didn't try to understand or imagine the experience of women in his books. And we all have a duty to do that. That's the approach I take with all of my characters. Everyone is a person. Everyone has their individual personalities, motivations, history, things they want, things they hate, places they're trying to get to. Every character, regardless of any demographics across the entire spectrum of gender, they all have those things that can be applied to them. That's how you describe them, from their characteristics, what they want, what they need. Everyone is a person, everyone has humanity, and that's the place that you need to write your characters from, not their bust size. That's only one side of it even, because there's still a huge problem of how do you write strong women characters, because a lot of writers seem to think that it's by applying typically male characteristics to a female character that makes her strong. So make her argumentative and angry and tough and muscular, that makes a strong woman character. It doesn't. It's not about that. Strength in characters, I think, comes in many different forms. I think a character that lacks emotion and is just tough isn't necessarily strong, and a vulnerable character who is very emotional is not weak. You have to think about your characters and think about what made them that way. What are they up against? What are they coming from? All of that stuff contributes to the, how strong they are or how weak they might be. You can show strength in characters in many different ways and you can show weakness in just as many ways. There's an almost unlimited amount of personalities and character traits to be had in the world. You can make your characters into whatever you want them to be but the more stereotypical you make them, the less interested people are gonna be in them. And the people that you're trying to describe with these characters, be that women or female presenting people, they're not gonna be impressed with the same old stereotypes and the same old characteristics that don't represent them and don't represent reality. So this is a great point and one I'm really glad to see because I think male authors especially still have a lot of work to do when it comes to how they depict women in their stories. I'm not saying I get it right 100% of the time. I don't. Everyone makes mistakes. We're all just trying to learn how to get better. But I think if your intent is to get things right and to accurately portray women on the page, then great. That's all you can do. Just keep learning and educating yourself and you'll write better stories for it. And if your response to this tip is disregard or disinterest or you're rolling your eyes, then I just wanna let you know, this isn't gonna change here. And I may only have a small platform, but I'm gonna try and use it to promote equality however I can. Like Justin Cronin says, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. A story needs to demonstrate from the get-go a thorough knowledge of itself. The reader should feel like they're in the presence of an authoritative storyteller. They will sense that. This is a very interesting one, and a slightly frightening one for someone that doesn't plot their entire stories throughout. But I think there's more to knowing your story and knowing where it's going than simply the plot points. I always have an idea of where my story is eventually gonna go, what the ending that I want, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about 
knowing your story as in the themes that it's getting across the point of it the heart of the story that's really what i'm getting at and i think you can know all of that through and through without knowing all of the twists and turns of your plot or your narrative i have a bit of a strange analogy for it for me it feels like carrying a venomous tarantula in a glass box. While it's contained within the box, it can't run off in all of these different directions as it's trying to. I know where I'm taking it, I know what the end goal is, and I know that it's contained within this glass box. So all of the time when it's running from left to right or up the walls and sticking to the ceiling, I don't know where it's going to be at any one particular moment, but I know that it's bound within the confines of this box. So that's how I look at my story. I might not know all of the twists and turns that are going on within the box. But I know ultimately where I'm taking the entire thing. And I really do think, as he says, that readers can feel that. They can feel that they're in the presence of an authoritative storyteller. When you know your story, you know the bones of it, then I think that really does shine through onto the page. And you don't get those moments like you sometimes get, I'm sure you've read those moments where you're like, I feel like they don't know where they're going with this story. That can very much happen, but if you know the story and you're faithful to it, and you follow it where you really feel like it should go, you can avoid that. But what if your tarantula is loose, but you know exactly what route it's gonna take? What if you've planned out your entire story, you know every twist and turn, you know every move this tarantula is gonna to make to try and escape, and you've thought about it ahead of time. As long as you end up where you need to go with it, you can just watch it make its way there. That works perfectly well. But I think a combination of the two is where the most security is. I think having it in that box and knowing where it's going, that's the ideal position to be in really. That's total control over your story. There's no doubt that'll be detectable right by the reader. They'll feel like they're in very good hands as they go through the story. Either way, you need to have at least one. You need to have the box or you need to know exactly where the spider is going to be at all times. The more I talk about this, the less it seems like it makes sense, but hopefully this translates. Whatever the case, the safest thing to do is have a good bearing on both if you possibly can. That way you're bound to steer your story exactly where you want it, and your readers are going to feel that. Those are some really great, valuable tips, and if you've never read the passage, I would definitely recommend it. So Terry Pratchett was a beloved fantasy author, probably best known for his Discworld series. I'm going to talk through some of his quotes and tips for writers, and at the end I'll share a great piece of his writing as well. Here's his first piece of advice. There could be no better grounding for a lifetime as an author than to see humanity in all its various guises. This is fundamental writing advice, I think. People are everything when it comes to storytelling. I often focus on creating real characters and deepening characterization. If you've been to my channel before, you will have heard me say, stories are all about people. But what I think we can sometimes overlook as writers, as we try to bring our vision of our story to life, is that we're actually writing it for someone else. I think it's important not to forget about that element of humanity, or that part of how people are linked to storytelling. And I don't mean we're writing for someone else, so make sure there's no typos, make sure your sentences are clear, make sure your story's easy to understand. All of that's important, but it's not what I mean. What I mean is, stories to me are about sharing some part of the human condition or bringing to light some experience of the writer that readers might have experienced too. That's how some of my favourite books have become my favourite books, because they speak to me as a person as well. I read them and think, yeah, me too. Humanity has various guises, as his quote says, so by all means, create them in your characters, but don't forget you're writing your story for them too. I read anything that's gonna be interesting, but you don't know what it is until you've read it. Somewhere in a book on the history of false teeth, there'll be the making of a novel. More great advice, I think. Sometimes the practice of writing regularly kind of elbows reading out of the way for me. Writing absolutely influences what books I'll pick up and read. Sometimes I'll pick up a book and think, yeah, I could read it, but I'm not sure I'm gonna get a whole lot out of it when it comes to my own writing. So then I'll prioritize a different book and get nothing out of that. I'm almost never correct. The issue with reading so selectively like that is that you'll absolutely miss things that could spark ideas. I call them micro ideas myself. And Terry Pratchett's absolutely right. Even in the most unlikely of texts, you might find a second of something or a little spark. I'm not saying that reading a leaflet in the dentist's office is gonna bring an entire novel to you, but it might just bring a little insight into how a character behaves or highlight a weird little scenario in life. Those micro ideas I often find are like the tip of an iceberg. Once you start getting them down on paper, 
you discover there's actually loads more to it underneath the waterline. It's happened to me many times, probably so many times that now I don't remember what that initial spark was because it's part of a massive project that I ended up finishing. It's worth reading anything you find interesting, as he says. Don't make the same mistake I do of trying to assess the value of reading something before you read it. It doesn't work. Writing a novel is as if you're going off on a journey across a valley. The valley is full of mist, but you can see the top of a tree here and the top of another tree over there. And with any luck, you can see the other side of the valley, but you cannot see down into the mist. Nevertheless, you head for the first tree. This is quite a famous piece of writing craft imagery from Terry Pratchett. Kind of like the micro ideas we were just talking about, he's absolutely right in that the mist can contain all kinds of storytelling gold. I think he put it really beautifully there. This is a kind of reassuring quote in many ways. I think at first every writer sees their story, if not as a misty valley, then as some other kind of incomprehensible expanse in front of them. And this quote personally reminds me to check myself on one of my biggest failings as a writer and to some extent as a person. I often find I want to know all of the information. I need to know absolutely everything there is to know beforehand so I can be ready. So obviously my inclination is to learn every detail of my story before I write it. But when I come to actually plan it that way, for some reason that approach has just never worked for me. So I often find myself standing in the misty valley beneath the only tree that I can see, the safety tree. And I'll think that I need to know exactly where the next tree is, how far away it is, how tall it is, what it looks like before I can make a move. But really I don't. When I leave the safe tree and I step into the mist, that's often where I find I do some of the writing that I'm most proud of. And I always end up finding the next tree just fine anyway. Got a little bit philosophical there, but the point still stands. You don't need to know absolutely everything about your story in order to write it. You've just got to spend time in the mist, and that's sometimes where the magic is. If necessary, I'll write the ending fairly early on in the process. Now that ending may not turn out to be the real ending by the time that I've finished, but I'll write down now what I think the conclusion of the book's going to be. This is an interesting approach and not something I've ever tried before. I tend to know what the ending of my story is going to be before I write the story, but I leave it till the end to write it. But I can definitely see the merit in writing it first. I could see how that would be helpful. To me, it's all about structure, and I don't mean three-act structure or story beats, templates, anything like that. I mean actual structure. It feels like the ending he's talking about here that he writes ahead of time almost acts like scaffolding or a frame that holds the story together as he builds it. Not to mention, if you're happy to write an ending knowing that it may entirely change by the time you get there, it could be great practice for settling into the story you're telling and settling into the voice of your narrator before you actually start in earnest. You can wear off the rust a bit with something that might not matter if you're gonna rewrite it anyway. And this is novel writing we're talking about, so you're always gonna end up rewriting it at least once. That's good advice, I would think, especially if you're struggling to get going with your story, so maybe give it a try. I also found a couple of general quotes from Terry Pratchett that though they don't directly concern writing, I think they can still absolutely apply. Here's the first one. It's not worth doing something unless someone somewhere would much rather you weren't doing it. As a person who makes creative writing content on YouTube, I am acutely aware of the people that would rather I weren't doing it. When my channel was smaller even than it is now, I didn't used to get these comments, but now that I do, I kind of look at them in the same spirit as this quote. And it happens with my writing too. I've had my writing described as cinematic by a prize that I was shortlisted for, and it was absolutely meant as a compliment and taken as one. But then I've also had people use the exact same word, cinematic, and meant it as an insult. Whatever the case, I think the way I look at it is the same way that Terry Pratchett looked at it. If we're making readers feel something about what we're writing, then we can't be doing too much wrong. The presence of those seeking the truth is infinitely to be preferred to the presence of those who think they've found it. I picked this quote out because it's a great reminder of why I write personally. I'm not writing because I think I'm brilliant and the world needs to know what I think. I'm not writing because I find the whole thing easy and I want the world to know how easy it is for me. Neither of those is true. I'm also not writing because I've figured a bunch of stuff out about how the world works or how people do. Like I was saying before, you don't need to know everything when you're writing. You don't need to have all of the answers. I often hear that your book needs to make a point. You need to write with meaning. It has to be about something. And I think that is true. But the way that I used to look at it was that I needed to make a huge contribution to the literary canon of human experience. But now I've realized that making a point with your writing or writing with meaning can simply mean wondering aloud what any of this is for. 
I want to finish with a quick piece of Terry Pratchett's writing, and I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands of passages I could have picked out, and if you know any, by all means, leave them in the comments for me. But the one I picked was from his novel, Night Watch. In fact, it was the opening lines. Sam Vimes sighed when he heard the scream, but he finished shaving before he did anything about it. As far as the story opening goes, it's got plot, it's got characters, it's interesting, and above all else, it makes you want to read on. There's not a whole lot else you could ask for with your opening lines, I don't think. Kurt Vonnegut was a writer and satirist, probably best known for his novel Slaughterhouse-Five. He was also famously a veteran of World War II. I'm going to talk through his eight basics of creative writing, and then at the end, there's a quote of his that I want to share with you as well. So here's the first tip. Use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel the time was wasted. I feel like this could be taken in many different ways really, but there's two main things that I took from it. Firstly, and obviously, I think it means tell a really good story. No writer wants a reader to put their book down and give up on it, of course. We might spend many months or even years working on our books, but regardless of all that effort, in the end we still have to present our stories in an engaging way. We still have to, in some sense, serve the reader. So, in my mind, we should do that by getting to the point of our story and not beating around the bush and reveling in our own writeriness. That's the first thing. The second thing I took from this is about the point of the story. There needs to be one. If we're using the time of a total stranger who's reading our book, we should definitely make sure we're making a point. We need to communicate something that matters to us or to them, especially if it's something they haven't considered before. Making a point was obviously really important to Vonnegut, and I'll come back to that at the end of the video when I've got that quote to read you, but for now, on to tip two. Give the reader at least one character he or she can root for. This might seem like really basic writing advice, but I think it's important that we don't overlook it. If you think back to your favourite book or story, what was it that really propelled you through that story? What was it that kept you reading? Having a great plot is really important, and it never harms reader retention, if you want to put it like that. But if we think a bit deeper, it's likely that it was the journey of the character that had you so invested. If your characters have no depth, and they don't pursue any particular goal, it can be really easy for your story to fizzle out and take the reader's interest with it. But as long as you have at least one character in your story that your readers can root for, the heart of your story will keep beating. That doesn't mean they have to be flawless, perfect, angelic characters, quite the opposite. They should definitely have flaws and something that they're trying to fix, which brings me on to Vonnegut's next point. Every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water. This is often heard advice, and for good reason. It keeps readers engaged, and it even helps to control the pace of the story. But I feel like I covered some of this in the last tip, so for this one, I'm going to get really, really specific and say, apply this to your dialogue. When I edit my own work, or I edit work from other writers, both beginners and more advanced, dialogue is often the point where the story starts to fall down. That's because it's easy to see what the main character wants from dialogue, or from every conversation that they have, what their goal is. But that's kind of it. Think about the last conversation you had. You will have wanted to steer it in one direction or the other. There will be something you wanted to get out of that conversation, even if it's a tiny thing, even if it's an unconscious thing. So will whoever you were talking to. And it functions exactly the same way in storytelling. Your main character's goals will always come first, but in that back and forth between characters, try thinking about what the other minor characters might want and reflect that in the words that they use. In my view, this makes dialogue feel more realistic and less generic, which is never a bad thing. I just want to take a few seconds to remind you about the developmental editing service that I run on my website. If you've got a piece of a novel or some short fiction that you really would like some feedback on, check out the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. Right, back to the video. Every sentence must do one of two things, reveal character or advance the action. I must have seen this written down many years ago before I started writing, because this has been my approach for as long as I can remember. It's what I keep in mind as I'm writing my first draft, and it's the bar by which I measure the story when I'm editing. Some sentences will do both, but they have to do at least one or the other, otherwise we're getting into the realms of tip number one, wasting the reader's time. With every sentence, tell us something about your character, what's inside them, what's driving them, or move the plot forward, reveal something or change something. Now every sentence doesn't have to introduce something brand new and exciting, that would be really tiring to write. But it should add depth to what we already know and widen our understanding of it, even just a, a tiny bit. If we look at each new sentence as a vine hanging from the jungle canopy and the reader is 
for some reason, Tarzan. We're creating this forward motion, we're sprouting new vines with every sentence that we write. If the next sentence we write doesn't forward the plot or expand the character, then Tarzan will reach out and find nothing, or he'll just swing backwards or fall. On balance, not really sure the Tarzan comparison works, but advance the plot or reveal more about your characters. If you only take one tip away from this video, make it that one. Start as close to the end as possible. I love this piece of advice because it made me think. My first response to this was to think, but then you're gonna have barely any story left. How would you ever write anything long enough to be a novel? But obviously, I see now, that's not what Vonnegut's talking about. He's not saying start your story at the end of the story. What he's saying is, have your story start in the right place. Don't pad it up front with loads of filler information and don't let it meander for ages until the point where it gets good. Start at the first relevant part, the part where it gets interesting for readers. If necessary, look at your outline or think about your journey for the story and consider the story beats within it. If there's a bit of space between the first and the second beat of the story, think about moving that beginning onward a bit to something that will catch the reader's attention. It's a really common mistake for writers to start their story in the wrong place. I've done it probably hundreds of times, but we can catch it and we can change it and that's one of the things that I love about writing. Be a sadist. No matter how sweet and innocent your leading characters, make awful things happen to them in order that the reader may see what they're made of. There is no story without hardship. And though Vonnegut makes it sound like you've got to throw your characters off a cliff and set them on fire, it doesn't have to be that visceral, I don't think. My opinion, and it is only that, is that the key thing here is making things awful for them. My advice is to be specific about it. I think there's only so much value to making things happen to your character that would be horrible if they happened to anyone. We'd still see what they're made of as they try to bounce back, but in a more generic sense. I think the real magic from this tip comes when we make horrible things happen to our characters that are horrible because it's specifically our character. Make their greatest fears come to pass. That thing they were dreading, make them face it. Make it specific and it'll tell us more about who they are. It might also make readers think about their greatest fear and if they could face it. Be horrible to them, that's for sure, but be specific about it. Write to please just one person. If you open a window and make love to the world, so to speak, your story will get pneumonia. I love the way he phrased that, and I definitely agree. It's good advice to write for one person. You hear that fairly often in advice from famous authors. It helps you keep your tone consistent, and it helps you stay focused on the important parts of your story instead of trying to please everyone. We can never do that, and attempting to write a book that everybody loves will often lead to a book that nobody loves because it lacks personality or it doesn't know who it is or what it is. The only amendment that I'd make to this advice, if I might be so bold, is to make the one person that you're writing your story for yourself. Tell yourself the story that you want to be told first of all before you worry about pleasing everybody else. Make it exist in the world, that perfect blend of all the things that you like. Write it primarily for you first and I think you'll follow the truest path to the story that you want to tell. Give your readers as much information as possible as soon as possible. To heck with suspense. Readers should have such complete understanding of what's going on, where and why, that they could finish the story themselves should cockroaches eat the last few pages. This is the only tip that I'm not sure I entirely agree with. To me, suspense is a great way of keeping your readers invested in your story and for maintaining momentum in something long like a novel. And I love not having all the answers when I'm reading a book. That really works on me. However, even if I don't completely agree with this tip, there's still something that I can take away from it that will benefit my writing. And that's thinking about it this way. Maybe you don't have to tell the reader everything, but as he says, you have to tell them as much as you can. Or to put it another way, only keep what you absolutely have to from the reader. If all it takes to sustain a mystery is for one piece of the puzzle to be missing, then just hide that one piece. I love a good mystery, but when every single detail is obscured or hidden, then there aren't any handholds that your readers can grip onto and they can end up falling right out. Are we back on Tarzan again? What the f Just keep from them only what you have to. That's what I would take from this. Now, I wanted to give you a quote from Vonnegut about how writers should approach their stories. Find a subject you care about and which you in your heart feel others should care about. It's this genuine caring and not your games with language which will be the most compelling and seductive element in your style. I think all writers, when we're in the thick of our writing, would do well to be reminded of that. <laughs>